I'm going to start pressing the buttons to um, start activating the connections just in case there's anything that needs some tidying up. Okay. So far, so good. And we are tonight also um, on Facebook, and we're also on um, channel 14, I believe. Okay, it looks like we are live um, on Facebook. And it looks like it's streaming from the um, from the TV. So people might just need a minute to get on there, but we are we are coming up at five o'clock. Things are looking good on my end. So much. Appreciate it, Mr. Cuomo. So I'm going to go ahead and um, call the meeting to order. This is the Charlottesville City School Board meeting for November 5th, 2020. Um, we are uh, meeting via Zoom per the emergency, uh, uh, the governor's emergency declaration as a result of COVID. This um, meeting is um, possible to be viewed on Facebook on our um, Charlottesville City School Board, uh, Charlottesville City Schools website on Facebook and on the Charlottesville City's public TV, in addition to the Zoom um, registration. Um, and the first item on the agenda is a moment of silence. So we're gonna do that now um, for a moment. Okay, thank you so much for that. And then we're going to do the um, roll call. Ms. Green? Hey, Julie's computer cut off unexpectedly, so I'm gonna do the roll until she's able to join us again. Uh, Mr. Present. Bryant? Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Pergier? Present. Ms. Torres? Yes. And Mr. Wade? Present. Thank you. Great. Um, we made a slight change to the agenda right before the meeting, um, but very slight. We moved one item from 7.3 to 8.2. Um, and, but with that, I need a move, uh, an approval of the agenda. So, so moved. moved. Second. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions or, okay. And go ahead, Ms. Thacker. Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morseberger? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. And Mr. Wade? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go now to the um, comments from members of the community. The Charlottesville City School Board welcomes comments from the community. Uh, we ask you to limit your comments to three minutes 
and state your name and address at the beginning of your comments for the record. Um, and with that, I will be doing the timing. And, but uh, Mr. Cuomo, who do we have? So I'll just, I know we get a lot of requests for um, pre-registration. I'll just ask anybody who's an attendee to please raise their hand or put a message in the chat so I can acknowledge them and prepare them to speak. Okay, um, we're gonna, going to start with Angel Firo and Angel has the ability to unmute at this time for the comment section. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you. This is Angel Firo. I am at Prospect Avenue. Um, good evening, Madam Chair and Board. Thank you so much for your time and the dedication and thoughtfulness you've put into months of meetings and plans. I know this weighs heavily on many of you, so thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you also to the teachers and administrators who are going above and beyond to make virtual learning work. Uh, Johnson Elementary School in particular has done an awesome job helping Abundant Life provide the materials we need to support virtual learning well. This process has not been easy for anyone. I just wanted to take a minute to ask that as we think about the future and the plans for reopening that we also take a look at the methods for doing so. It would be great to hear from even more families on their experiences with virtual learning and the education system in general because they all have such valuable perspectives. One thing be extremely helpful is evaluating the process by which we go about hearing from the public. School board meetings take place on weekday evenings at 5 p.m., which is only accessible for certain families. Many working class families are not yet home from work at this time. Uh, we see the same issue with a lot of PTO meeting times, committee meetings like the COVID-19 committee, which took place at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays, and also school events. When thinking about equity in our schools, we also need to think about equity and accessibility when it comes to getting more parent involvement and feedback. We want the voices we are hearing to be representative of all of the community, not just portions of it. Let's take a good hard look at the ways we do things and make some crucial changes to be more inclusive so that things are not just geared towards middle or upper middle class families with two parent homes. On another note, there is also recent data highlighted in both an NPR article and a New York Times article pointing to the possibility of schools being open, not having much influence on positivity rates or the spread of the virus. Multiple researchers have concluded that schools have not become super spreaders of the virus with adequate safety measures and protocols in place. Let's be sure to look into these studies more deeply as we reevaluate numbers and influential factors in December. Once again, I'm so grateful for all the work that everyone is doing and I hope moving forward, we can have an even greater sense of what all of our community is experiencing and wanting in terms of education. Thank you again for your time. Ms. Fierro, appreciate it. Um, are we gonna go to Ms. Tillich? Ms. Uh, yes, Tillich? yes, and I've just, Giving okay. Kate the ability to unmute. Okay. You have three minutes, Ms. Tillich. Hold on, I have to turn up my volume, sorry. Um, thank you for taking my comment. Um, I am uh, Kate Tillich, 1526 Oxford Road. Um, I'm speaking um, against in-person classes at this time in January. Um, it seems to me that if a return in January would be right after the holidays and people are potentially traveling gathering. Uh, COVID cases are apparently um, extremely high in the country. And so um, the timing of it, you know, coming back to school and gathering right after all of these multiple risks um, doesn't seem like, uh, it doesn't, doesn't give me confidence or make me feel safe. So I'm, I'm against it. Um, I'd also like to ask what is being done regarding LGBTQ policies for schools. Um, Dr. Atkins, you and I are both aware that the Virginia Values Act comes into effect January 1st, but that does not mean that nothing can happen in the meantime. Um, the last action that was taken by Charlottesville City Schools was an act of discrimination when the gender identity policy was pulled. And after a big uh, community outcry and support from the school board, it was apparently reinstated. 
but I would like to know what is happening in support of um, LGBTQ education. And the, and the more I understand how the school system works, the more I understand it is a hierarchy. So Dr. Atkins, I do have to appeal to you and to Dr. Odie, those um, you know, in, in charge of the school system and those in charge of curriculum to um, please educate yourselves on the needs of LGBTQ students, staff, community members, you know, the whole, the whole list of everyone involved in the schools. Um, it's great that we have the Virginia Values Act. It means nothing if we don't act on it, if we don't understand what it is, and if we don't start to put in place policies that support LGBTQ students. Um, so again, um, please look into creating policies that support LGBTQ community and students. Um, the la I don't know what my time is, but I, I've mentioned this statistic before that you, know, you can look on the, like the Trevor Project website, there's a national statistic that says 40% of LGBTQ youth, which is under 18, are at risk. And that means 40% of LGBTQ youth are at risk for suicidal ideation or attempted suicide. Um, and so, and all of this information, you know, I, I want to be clear that I am a parent. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an, an activist. I'm not affiliated with any group. You know, I sit at my computer and I look up policies to share. And, and so anyone who can hear my voice right now is, is able to do the same, um, to look up statistics and look up what is applicable to, um, you know, to education and to our school systems to start getting ready to, uh, to apply the Virginia Values Act and do more in support of LGBTQ students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Tillich. Who's next, Mr. Cuomo? Um, we have Kara West. Kara has the ability to unmute at this time. Thank you. Um, good evening, school board members, Dr. Atkins, staff members. My name is Kara West. I am at 1105 Locust Avenue, and I have a third grader at Burnley Moran and a sixth grader at Walker Upper Elementary. Um, I would like to acknowledge and honor all of the difficult work and decision-making you are all doing every day. Thank you. A special shout out to the teachers and the school level administrators. I've been impressed every day in this virtual adventure. Um, tonight, I am speaking as the <clears throat> Walker Buford United PTO rep to the Joint PTO Reopening Fund, Ready to Teach, Ready to Learn. And I just want to provide a short update on the progress of the fund to date. Uh, it is administered through a partnership with the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation and prioritizes equity um, in meeting the needs of students, families, and teachers during these challenging times. Um, with the equity emphasis, it is designed to allocate funds to each school based on the school's overall population of students and the percentage receiving free and reduced school lunches. And then individual school committees comprised of a teacher, an administrator, a PTO rep, and a member of the CCS's equity committee make decisions based on each school's individual needs. Since our last report a month ago, the reopening fund has received an additional $30,000 for an overall total of $160,587 from 184 donors. 80,000 from the fund has already been distributed to each school according to the equity formula and the remaining 80,000 balance is in process to be distributed soon. To give you an idea of how the equity formula plays out, the elementary school in our district with the fewest students qualifying for free or reduced lunch is receiving approximately $7,000 from the fund while the elementary school with the highest percentage of students receiving free and reduced lunch will get almost $20,000 from the reopening fund. The school level committees have used these funds for home learning materials such as manipulatives for younger students, art supplies, books, and more, supplemental tech needs like headphones, additional Chromebook chargers and styluses uh, for support of community partners, running virtual learning centers and for direct family aid, including food and basic necessities. We would like to thank everyone, community members, parents, local businesses and foundations who have donated to this initiative. It's been more successful than we imagined. And most of the donations were from individuals ranging from $10 all the way up to a $25,000 donation 
from a prominent citizen. Uh, the majority of those donations came in the $100 to $500 level. We received $5,000 from a local law firm, $1,000 from a local fuel company, $1,000 from the Public Education Foundation of Charlottesville Albemarle, and um, big matching grants from Bama Works and the Smith Family Fund. So again, we wanted to update you and to thank you all for your work. And as uh, this joint PTO group can, uh, plans to review West, your time is up and uh, consider joint fundraising again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. West. Appreciate it. Who's next, Mr. Cuomo? Um, that is everybody that, that is currently um, had their hand raised or uh, put their name or comment in the chat. So I'll leave it to you for a, a certain amount of time. And then, oh, we do have a digital person. Um, I've got Marva Simpson, and I've um, given Marva the ability to unmute. Ms. Simpson, you have three minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the board for allowing me this opportunity to share my comments. My name is Marva Simpson. I live on Rugby Avenue. My son attends CHS. This is his first year at the school. He's in the ninth grade. My son is carrying seven classes. This includes five core subjects and two electives. For nearly two months, I have been asking the school to allow my son to drop his electives so that he can focus his efforts on core subjects. I've been told by the school staff that he can't drop the electives because the electives are required for graduation. I then made an adjustment to my request and ask that he be allowed to drop just one elective, which is commercial photo one. Again, I was met with resistance. For a third time, I adjusted my request and asked that my son be allowed to take one elective at another time within the next four years, perhaps even during the summer. This request was also denied. I have watched my son agonize over this class. He has cried. He has become angry. He has lashed out. He has asked me to console him. He has told me, Mom, I can't do this class. There are so many steps. This, this class is hard for me. He is unable to process the instructions during virtual learning and independently. He has only been able to turn in a few assignments. The only reason he was able to turn in the assignments is because he received substantial help from me and a friend who happens to be a professional photographer. At this moment in time, he is failing the course. I have a law degree and I'm unable to navigate the multiple platforms and the technical requirements of this course. I have sat in on sessions with my son and his teacher I've taken notes, still my notes and my assistance were of no use when it came to my son being able to independently complete an assignment. What is most outrageous about this particular situation is that my son has a 504. Even with a 504, CHS is unable to accommodate my son in this challenging virtual educational environment. I have spoken to similarly situated parents of children with 504s and IEPs that are in other neighboring school districts. The school agreed. They, they've dropped classes, even core classes. I personally know of one particular child in the 10th grade who was able to drop art and geometry. Yet, I'm not being heard at CHS. When I ask that my son be allowed to drop just one elective with the condition that he take the elective at a time when learning is in person. I'll leave the board with this because I know my time is limited. Number one, what educational purpose- Time is, is up, Ms. Simpson, I'm so sorry. Can you wrap it up, please? Sure, um, so I'll just get to the, the point. I'm asking assistance from the school board and from the, the CHS to do that which is mandated by law, which is to provide access to an education that is meaningful and an education that does not harm my child's emotional well-being or inhibit his future success. These standards are non-negotiable. 
And this is just not my child. I'm speaking for all the children of, C of uh, the Charlottesville City Schools. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. Mr. Cuomo? Um, I guess I'll give a one more call. At this time, there are no hands raised and no messages in the chat. Okay, so I am going to close public comment and move on to the next item on the agenda. There is another opportunity to, to comment, um, provide public comment, and that is at the end of the meeting. We have another time for public comment. And of course, um, you can always email us at schoolboard at charlottesvilleschools.org. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close it and ask that we move on to the con just consent agenda. Anybody have any questions on this consent agenda? Madam Chair, I move the adoption of the consent agenda. Second. Great, thank you. Any comments or questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote then. Ms. Thacker, are you the person or is Ms. Green the person? I'm back. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Ms. Green. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. And Mr. Wade? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, and then um, there is not an opportunity at this um, in, in on the agenda, but I'm just going to uh, use my prerogative to um, say uh, to ask Ms. Torres um, to speak about the PTO, Ms. What Ms. West talked about, if you don't mind doing that. No, now. yeah, not at all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, on behalf of the entire school board, we just wanted to um, address Ms. West's comments and, and thank uh, the 184 uh, donors who have stepped up to support our schools um, and the PTO. So thank you very much. We much appreciate it. Yeah, we definitely, thank you, Ms. Torres. I appreciate that. Um, and um, we know there are a lot of parents who helped organize that and uh, we know that this is a, not an insignificant amount of time that um, it takes to raise all that, that sort of money. So we really do appreciate it. Um, uh, we also have time at the, end of the, at the end of the agenda for board member comments, which is where I suspect we'll be addressing some of the items that were talked about in public comments. So I just wanted to make that note as well, because I'm sure that some of us are itching to talk about it, but we also want to get to the meat of the agenda before, um, I don't know, it gets too dark. Who knows? Um, so um, go ahead and move on to the um, proposed budget calendar. Dr. Atkins, if you want to introduce Ms. Hoover? Or shall I go directly? Thank you, Ms. McKeever. Um, we'd like to now ask that uh, Ms. Renee Hoover um, just do a quick overview of that uh, calendar, please. Good evening, everyone. Hi, welcome. Thank you. The, the budget calendar was presented uh, at the last board meeting um, and it's being brought to you, back to you to approve. Uh, I will note that the uh, joint school board uh, work session with city council uh, day was populated and that would be July 28th. Um, I don't have anything else to add to this. So July 28th or January? I'm sorry, January. I was like, I feel like the budget might be done by then. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't, time is irrelevant right now. I have no idea what day, you know, what month it is. So that makes sense. Okay, great. So January 28th will be the work session with city council. Great. Anybody have any questions about our budget calendar? Yeah, just um, what, what time is that meeting on 28th again? It, it would be at 5 p.m. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any other questions about it? 
Thank you. Uh, okay, so any we're, this is an action item and we had it last month as an information item. So I'll take any motions at this time. I move the adoption of the budget calendar, Madam Chair. Yes. Nah, Leah's on it tonight, man. You I'll don't second. know. You you don't know. Yes, I am. We have a lot to cover. Okay. And, we're, and we're trying not to be here until midnight. My understanding is that Bachelorette starts at eight, and that's what Miss Perrier wants to get to. Oh, okay. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I've, al I've already missed uh, our CHS alum, Eugene's program, from 5 to 5.15. So I just want you to know that I would like to catch the podcast before his next live stream tomorrow at 5 p.m. Got it. Okay. So do I have a second, Mr. Wade? Uh, yes. Second. Okay. Any comments or questions on the budget? <clears throat> okay, so um, go ahead and vote now, I guess, Ms. Green. Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Yes. Dr. Crabb? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. And Mr. Wade? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. What's next on the agenda is the um, CARES Budget Act by Ms. Hoover. Don't get away too quick, Ms. Hoover. No, they, they, they put my items back to back. <laughs> um, the, the, the city schools has uh, received a, a significant amount of money in the uh, first uh, four months of this fiscal year. And we're asking the, the board to amend our budget to, to add this money in there. Um, Leslie, can you go to the next slide? Uh, this is much needed money that we have received. 85% of it is CARES related. Um, you, uh, you've already received a presentation on the private foundation uh, money last month. Um, and there will be, Kim will talk uh, a little later uh, about uh, $200,000 of the city's CARES uh, CRF money. Um, that was given to us in two pots, um, 200,000 for facilities, um, yes, 200,000 for facilities and 50,000 for student support. Um, there was a lot of acronyms uh, associated with this money that I have a, a legend at the bottom to help um, identify those acronyms. The next slide. Um, what's the plans for these funds? Uh, these funds uh, had specific requirements uh, around them. And each one of these bullets outlines uh, the specific requirement that we're using the funds. Uh, we're using the funds for our remote learning to support our remote learning. We purchased hotspots and additional Chromebooks. Um, the, the first part of uh, CARES money that we received has a designation of uh, replacing any lost revenue. So we're uh, holding that out because we don't know what uh, the remainder of this fiscal year uh, holds for us. Um, in previous presentations, you understand that we've taken a lot of mitigation actions for personal protective equipment and supplies for our students and our staff and returning uh, to school. Um, We've um, had staff uh, do a lot of online curriculum development that, that we have supported them with. And then you'll again hear uh, later about purchasing and installing air filtering equipment that this money will be used for. The next slide. So as I said, this money has special requirements to them that it's specially designated. So we're adding uh, this two million seven hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred sixty-three dollars to our special revenue, which means uh, designated money that has a special purpose for it. Um, by adding this money to our special revenue, our overall budget 
will be amended to $91,680 and 600, I'm sorry, $91,680,651. Next slide. So tonight what we're asking the school board to do is to approve amending our budget um, by the $2,787,563. In addition, we will also be asking the city council to amend the school board's budget by this amount um, also. Um, is there any questions in what I've gone over? Ms. Hoover, I have a question, please, Madam Chair. I, can you explain why the, the $500,000 um, from the private foundation um, is included in our request to city council for amending our budget? Well, you know, I, understand. Any, I think all the other funding was allocated or funneled through them to us. Is that correct? Anytime there is a, I want to say a 5%, anytime there's a large amount of money add, uh, given to us, we needed to add it to our budget. And that's the reason that we're asking the city to amend our budget by this so we can just recognize it. If it was a small grant, like $50,000, we normally would not do that. But because this is a large sum of money, we want to go ahead and recognize it and amending our budget. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Hoover, the funds that you indicated that were CARES money, is there a, um, sunset time for these funds to be spent or will they be able to be with us for the entire fiscal year? Each, each one of these uh, CARES funds does have a sunset uh, expiration date on them. Um, the, the CARES Act, um, ESSA and the ESSA gear set aside, they have expiration dates of September 30th 2021. Mm -hmm. The uh, CARES CRF uh, funds that we're receiving from the state and from the city, they have expiration dates of December 31st, 2020. So can we presume that those funds will be spent on or before or obligated by the 31st of December? Yes, ma'am. Uh, these funds uh, will have will be obligated by November 30th, and we will have spent them by December 31st. Okay. These are our first priority funds to spend. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Kraft, you have a question? Miss my I don't, most of you guys are not on my screen. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, so Ms. Hoover needs us to take action on this. Ooh, can I do that? <laughs> this is exciting. I love uh, making a motion to add money to our budget. So <laughs> this is great. Uh, so I move that we approve the amended budget of the amount 2,700,000, whatever it is, um, that amount. I move that we um, amend our budget. Second. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, I guess any questions or comments at this time? Madam Chair, just for clarification, please. So some of that money that um, sunsets on December 31st. Um, so I know this is, we've talked about this a little bit before in CIP. Um, so noting that that money is, is being used to purchase certain things, is that enough? Is that a guarantee that we won't lose it? Uh, if I may, the, we're, we're actually using these funds for things that not only will we have encumbered the money with purchase orders, but we're also confident that the um, purchase orders will be liquidated and we will be able to receive the invoice and, and you know, complete the full process for those funds. We've been very intentional about selecting the items that go into the funds that expire on December 31st. 
Great. <clears throat> it is our intent, Ms. Um, Torres, that we not lose any of those funds, that we make sure that we are very focused on issuing those purchase orders so that we can expend those dollars. Absolutely great. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? With respect to this, um, the, there must be a, a sub, an, an additional like loss of revenue as a result of the sales tax decreases and all of this. So when do we see that as, a, as in the budget process here? As soon as we receive that information from the state, uh, as of right now, they're sending us projections, but those projections are, um, have a lag on them. Um, we've just gotten a set of projections that show a decrease in sales tax revenue. Um, however, we are inquiring with the state because we've received a report saying the state may be, uh, have, have been able to um, generate sales tax that will cause them to make their budget. So with that information, we're just waiting for them to give us clarification on if this is lagging data and we can anticipate getting full funding uh, or will we actually be decreased. So we're still waiting for clarification on that. And as soon as we get it, Ms. McKeever, we anticipate it'll come maybe in the next few weeks, uh, no later than December, and we'll bring that to the board. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else have a question? Okay, we have a motion. Okay, so Sherry, Dr. Kraft did the motion. Did somebody second it? Yeah, okay, Mr. Wade did. Okay, can we go ahead and call, do the vote now, Ms. Green? Okay, Mr. Bryan? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morseberger? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. Mr. Wade? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Okay, next we have, um, we're going to go to items for discussion, which is the student representatives of school board. And um, Dr. Odie's doing this. Yes, she'll uh, introduce Dr. Arizari. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Atkins. At this time, I will invite Dr. Eric Irizarry, our Charlottesville High School principal, to explain the process used to select our student representatives to the board and introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Irizarry. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite board meetings every, every year, uh, introducing our school board reps. So uh, we had a, a lot of applications this year. We did it uh, via Google form, just because obviously we're virtual. And I do wanna thank uh, Mr. Juan Diego Wade for helping us select um, our candidates this year, our school board reps this year. So um, can I, should I just go ahead and introduce at this point? Yes, yes. I'll start by, uh, for the first time we have uh, our ninth grader. So I'm gonna start down with our ninth grader. Uh, Jason Johnson comes to us from Buford Middle School where he was the former Buford Middle School president and a Buford Middle School mentor. Um, he is our first uh, ninth grade student school board rep. So I do wanna welcome uh, Jason Johnson. Hello. Hi, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for joining us. No problem. So ambitious, ninth grade. Yeah. We're excited to have you, especially right now, such an unusual transition. So thank you for stepping up. Um, are the others here too, Dr. I? Yep, yep. I'm going. Yep, I'm going down as well. So okay, great. Thanks. Yep, we have uh, two seniors. Um, Maddie Packer um, is a very familiar face and name here at Charlottesville High School. She is in the National Honor Society, part of the National Latin Society, and also part of the National Math Honor Society, and is a state champion in track. Um, Maddie Packer has been with us uh, since I've been here, um, and we're welcome. Uh, we're just grateful to have her aboard as well. So Maddie, anything you'd like to, to say? I'm happy to be here and to listen in on the meetings. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you for joining us. Will she be the second one, Dr. I? Yes. Okay, great. And um, Adiba Kadari is our, uh, our last rep and she will be serving tonight and she will be first in the rotation. And that name may sound uh, familiar because Nadia was uh, one of our first school board reps as well. So continuing the tradition, uh, 
Adiba is our vice, our SEA vice president, a member of Bacon, and also a link crew leader here at Charlottesville High School. So we want to welcome uh, Adiba to the school board reps as well. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm very grateful and eager to be an active student voice for the school board. Thank you so much. Don't worry, we have some questions. <laughs> um, go, ahead. go ahead, Dr. I. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah, so I was going to say, I, I know we're having uh, more frequent school board meetings, so I will be working with uh, the student school board reps to make sure we have the schedule. So Adiba will be here tonight and for the next school board meeting as well. And then I'll submit their schedule. Um, all three are very active with extracurricular activities as well. So we'll work out some alternative um, uh, substitutions if we have to, if sports or clubs or honor societies um, conflict with the students, with the uh, school board meetings. Mr. Wade, did you want to say something? Yes, yes, I, I did. I just want to say that, um, again, thank Dr. I for inviting me to do this. And this is one of the most important things that, that we do. I believe we've done um, as a school board is to have this input. And I look at it, our representative tonight, I remember her as a um, eighth grade and ninth grader running around in, in high school. And now she's ready to take, I mean, she hasn't been shy to share her opinion with me you know, and, and now she has the platform, so welcome. And um, Maddie, I mean, she's a rock star. She, um, she's gonna do great things. Um, I can't wait to get her input. And um, the young man, Jason, I mean, he, he's a rock star. I mean, we saw his credentials. We're like, we, we, we got to have this young man. Um, so, um, you know, even in these unusual times, um, it's good that we still can, can can continue this. And I wasn't sure if we were going to do it, Dr. I. So when you contacted me, I was, um, I was really happy. And I talked to Ned recently, Ned Mickey, who, who um, was one of the ones really kind of spearheaded this. And he was really happy that we we're continuing this. And, and so I'm glad that we can do this. This input is pivotal. Uh, the school boards really want to do this and asking us how we are able to, to incorporate more than just one in the year and how we really try to get um, a different group of students to involve. So I just like the process and thank you, Dr. I, for all the work that you do this and, and welcome. Can I just say that um, I think particularly this year, um, it's gonna be so important for us to hear from all of you about what the student experience is like. And, you know, because I think uh, we, you know, we're not there. And um, we really need to know, you know, what are the stress points, you know, what's working well, what's not working well. Um, and we really, I think we, you know, we value your input, um, you know, even, even more than usual because of this weird environment that we're in. So I really appreciate you being involved with us. Madam Chair, um, I'd like to congratulate our members and uh, Dr. Atkins and Dr. Irizarry, I would like to uh, give you both your first uh, student school board rep assignment. As you know, each year, the Virginia School Board Association holds its annual conference, and there is a session for student board representatives. And so I hope that the two of you in your busy schedules because I don't, I can't even begin to imagine what your schedules are like, that the two of you can find the time to text, email, chat, or whatever. And if Dr. Odie needs to lead that charge, I'm sure she can, because I would very much like to have our three fine stellar representatives uh, attend the workshop later on this month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prayer. Um, any of the student reps have any um, comments that they would like to add to their comments already? Well, we're really excited to have you, obviously. Um, and any other board members have any comments or questions? Yeah, I'd just like to congratulate our new student reps and um, look forward to you uh, participating and giving us a lot of great feedback. Again, congrats and welcome on, on board. So much. Um, and can I add one thing? Of course. 
I just want to say welcome and that um, we're so glad you're here and that I hope you um, feel comfortable asking questions and questioning policies and there, you know, there are no wrong or bad questions. So just make sure that, you know, just be comfortable and we're happy you're here. Ditto. I might as well add my uh, welcome to the three of you. Congratulations for being chosen and um, I really do look forward to hearing your thoughts and your input um, as representatives for the, the rest of the students. So thank you for being here. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I'd also want to congratulate all three of you for being on board. We're so glad to have you here. And we absolutely, as all of the board members have said, want to hear your voice. We also want you to use this as an opportunity to learn and to grow as you grow in your leadership. Uh, this is another opportunity for you to understand board governance, how a board operates, because at some point in your life, I imagine each one of you will be a part of a board or actually will lead a board. Um, so we're glad to have your board and don't be ashamed to or, or, or um, shy about asking questions and lending your voice. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Irizarry and Mr. Wade and the other the team at CHS who helped to identify um, among the applicants our chosen school board members. Thank you very much. Um, having said that, I would like to move on to the next agenda item, which is the um, determination and notice for emergency procurement of HEPA air filters units. Okay, Ms. Powell, um, you have two um, of our, our support team from the city who's here with you, Jerry and um, Mark. So Ms. Powell. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Atkins. Um, what I'm going to do this evening is talk about the determination and notice to purchase um, HEPA air purifier units in the context of providing a brief update on how the city is supporting our COVID-19 mitigation efforts and some other preparations that are underway to increase um, our opportunity to provide in-person learning in our schools. So, um, Leslie, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, and I'm going to, I know this is a lot of words, but there's been so much interest and in conversation around this topic that I just, I feel like this is important information to have out there so that staff and families can see the latest. So as of today, all building filter upgrades have been completed, except for nine classrooms at Clark that have the MERV 13, 14 filters on back order, but they're still expected in December. Um, the IFB, which stands for invitation for bids that the city put out um, back in October, that is the um, the invitation to for bidding on the enhanced the equipment which um, provides additional air disinfection measures. It's UVC and bipolar ionization equipment. Um, the IFB process has been extended by one week, uh, and there are still concerns about you know product availability and lead times once the contract is awarded. Um, the school division um, administration, myself, will keep facilities maintenance um, you know up to date on our return to in-person learning plans so that as equipment comes in, they can prioritize where the different um, pieces of equipment are installed in the schools. And we do still in expect those installations to start in December and uh, or January and be completed either during March or April. That is still the expectation. Um, this is where we get into the determination and notice uh, piece of the agenda item. Given the extension in the IFB process and the uncertainty that remains around product availability and, um, and lead times and then the timeline for installation, facilities maintenance um, is supportive of CCS moving forward with purchasing um, a large quantity of HEPA air purifier units as an additional air handling mitigation measure. So um, the item that's before you for, your, for consideration for action this evening would be to allow us to purchase 452 additional units that are sized for classrooms uh, using a portion of the funds that the city set aside for COVID response measures in our schools. And um, going forward as, an, as another important note, CCS will provide facilities maintenance with an inventory of where all these HEPA air filter units are deployed so that these units can be incorporated in the filter management program uh, going forward along with all the other new equipment. Uh, Leslie, you can go to the next slide. 
So um, this slide just provides um, some more detailed information for the board and public about uh, how we will be using the $200,000 that the city uh, generously um, put aside from their CARES funds to enable us to respond to miscellaneous additional COVID response measures in our schools. Um, $142,418 would be for the purchase of the 452 HEPA air purifiers. $493,000 is for 140 replacement HEPA filters for 68 units that are already deployed in our frequently occupied spaces, primarily offices and some conference areas and cubicle areas that where we've been working nonstop um, basically since March. And um, then there are 40 water fountain bottle fill stations included in our plan for the um, for the $200,000 and that totals $44,065. And last but not least, $8,534 will be used for the water fountain lockout caps and other mitigation measures that have already been installed in the schools. This could include things like some sliding glass windows that were put in at offices and um, things like that. So uh, we truly have appreciated this partnership with the city and all of their forward thinking, particularly around air handling um, and, and you know, enable positioning us to operate under these pandemic conditions. So at this time, we do have um, Mark Zavakar, who is the facilities maintenance manager for our public works team. And then we have Jerry Martin, and who's also in facilities maintenance. He's the HVAC manager. And I really do appreciate them being willing to carve out the time to just be available on the panel tonight in case you all have questions about um, any of these mitigation measures around air handling. Um, or comments that you would like to make. So I'd like to pause here briefly to see if you have any questions or comments. I have a question, if I could. Of course. Um, the 452 air purifiers that you were getting as a, maybe I misunderstood, is it a backup that because installation or a certain work won't be done? I was just not really understanding um, what they were a backup for. They're, they're an additional, so when it comes to fil air filtration or purification, if you will, myself and Jerry and Mark, we've all been talking about this. It truly is sort of a more the merrier type thing. You can't go wrong adding more measures. And there are, there could be, you know, delays in, re um, in receiving and installing some of the um, bipolar ionization equipment, which has that high level of filtration with the added benefit of the bipolar ionization component. And so this does enable us to, um, you know, better weather any delays if, um, with the potential delivery and installation for those items because everything that's related to COVID mitigation is in high demand and we find that we sometimes can experience longer than promised or longer than anticipated lead time. So that it, it is a bit of a hedge, but it's also a meaningful, you know, it's a good additional measure to have in place. It, and Jerry or Mark, would you like to comment on that further? Yes, I would. This is Mark Zavikar. Thank you uh, to the school board and Dr. Atkins and the administration for allowing us uh, this opportunity to um, present um, our story to you. Uh, yes, Kim, you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the, the HEPA units um, will supplement the um, over 400. I have a number of uh, 497, uh, of which some of those are um, surplus units, but about 450 units of the bipolar ionization portable units that will be uh, distributed in the classroom. And with that type of quantity uh, that we're looking at, we do, uh, we hope not to experience any delays, but those quantities and what's, what's going around in the, um, the localities, if everybody wants similar units, um, uh, we expect there could be some delays. So these HEPA units will support and supplement what we will eventually have in the classrooms. And I might add that the part of the reason for the um, request for the board to take action tonight on the uh, determination and notice for an emergency procurement is we have a quote and a vendor lined up who's promised delivery in November. So we have a high degree of confidence that we're going to get the HEPA filter units that we have specified. And so, um, but it is, we're in competitive procurement situation. If we can't do competitive bids, we're certainly in competitive procurement situations because we're all going after the same types of equipment. And because of the quantity we're getting, it is a purchase that's over $100,000. So we wanted to bring that forward because it's a single purchase for that for over 100,000. 
So at the next meeting, you'll be able to tell us if you've submitted the, if we approve it, you'll be able to give us the update on if it was received in November. Absolutely. Yes, in fact, um, but this vendor has already delivered a smaller quantity of these units as part of what I mentioned before, where some of us, we've been working and we've been in the spaces and meeting with, with each other nonstop since March. And so we did procure a smaller quantity of the same type of unit and they were very reliable in their delivery. So when I contacted them as this other situation was unfolding, I, I, I do have a, a fairly high degree of confidence that they will deliver on that as quoted, which would put us well within the timeline for expending the funds, this, this particular bucket of funds. Dr. Kraft? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, on one of the slides, it said the installation of some of these units might not be completed until March or April. And is that because we may not get them? Um, you know, we may not be able to actually get them here uh, procured, or is it a delay because of the installation schedule? Here you are. It's the installation schedule. Uh, the, we're dealing with over 730 individual pieces of equipment that are going to be receiving some, some type of um, COVID mitigation effort, um, whether it's going to be uh, bipolar ionization, uh, which is one sy symptom, or system, I should say, or um, UV lighting, or MER-14s. And because of the the sheer numbers that we're dealing with and, and, and uh, the technical expertise. It's going to take us, uh, we believe, until March, uh, later or mid-April. And, and so is there any, I mean, I guess, I understand, I guess, that we're getting these supplemental portable units, you know, to um, sort of offset that. But what, what are the implications of not having some of those installed while students and staff are in our buildings. Let's say that, you know, students and staff are coming in January and February, and these might not be installed until the end of March or April. What are, what are the safety and health implications of that? Well, that's when we're anticipating um, reaching substantial completion and then completing installations by mid-April. We will start, um, right now we're in the IFB process. We um, expect to receive, uh, next Monday we will receive the bids when the bids are due. And as we proceed through the uh, awardance process and having the contracts reviewed, um, we expect the contractor, the winning contractor, to start ordering the material immediately for delivery um, in and around mid-December to early January. That's when the material is going to start coming in. So with um, the school system prioritizing classrooms and areas that we need to address first, that's where we're going to start making the installation. That's where we're going to start. If, and if I may, I think um, this may also help. I don't know that it will, but it's hard to know exactly when you ask what are the implications it's hard to give a, a, a certain answer on that but what I can say with a high level of certainty is the school divisions I'm familiar with that are already doing hybrid and four and five day a week in person instruction they don't have equipment like this at, I mean this what the city is doing with this IFB and and bipolar ionization and UVC deployment on such a broad scale is beyond anything I'm aware of from colleagues I talk with in other school districts who are already operating with a lot of face of in-person instruction. Um, so I don't want, I think this is exciting and, and incredibly, and just a great thing. I, one of the reasons that I, I told Mark and uh, Jerry, I wanted them here today is I, I really want to publicly express my gratitude for to the city and for their efforts to really be on what I feel is the cutting edge of, of pushing forward um, some technologies that are um, beyond even the standard ASHRAE recommendations for COVID mitigation, so. Hey, Kim, I, I'm sorry, if I could just add real quickly to that. Uh, the schools are not without support now. Uh, we've installed the MERV 14 filters in pieces of equipment and all the schools that will accept them. 
So the bipolar ionization and the UV light in is, um, is supplemental to the mer 14s and the portable units are for areas that are not able to be serviced by the equipment that's already um, been treated. Merv, I think it would be good to, to help everyone understand that there's a three-prong approach to um, the mitigation or the, the air handling in our system, the Merv filters, and then the HEPA uh, air purifiers, and then the um, UV ionization. So there are three different pieces of equipment. Two uh, will be in by the end of January, and then the third one will be installed as the equipment comes in and they are able to install that. Thank you. That's a good one. It's definitely, with mitigation in general, it's a layered approach. You do you know, measure after measure after measure, and even within, within air handling, we're doing a layered approach. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's um, something that I really, again, commend the, our city partners for um, everything they're doing with us and for us in this, on this front. And I, I would say also that this is not just, um, COVID certainly did bring about these three different layers of, of um, protection for our staff and our schools and our students, um, but it will not end once COVID um, we move beyond COVID. We will continue to have this type of air handling in our buildings um, well beyond COVID. Are there um, any other board members uh, who Madam, have questions? Go ahead. Madam Chair, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I do, I do wanna um, also express my gratitude to um, Mr. Zavakar and Mr. Martin, thank you for being here in the city for supporting the schools this way. Um, this is, you know, above and beyond. Um, and I think it's great that we are able to kind of share this with the public and in this forum so that they understand, um, you know, partnering with us and your support of, of our students. Um, and I, I did want to just ask a question about the freestanding or the, the smaller air purifiers. And I know we had talked about this in another setting. This would be something that facilities or HVAC, you guys are maintaining those and changing the filters out on those, or will that um, be something that, that our staff is going to be trained in managing and handling? Facility maintenance uh, will be responsible for changing the filters. Um, in addition, we are already, we're in our budget process right now, so we are already budgeting for the anticipated extra cost that these filter changes are, are gonna, we're gonna incur. But yes, we will be doing the filter changes. Okay, thank you both very much. No, it's been, I was really grateful um, at the, a recent CIP meeting to learn that you all had, um, um, gotten a consultant to look at our air quality and to find ways um, to support um, our air quality in our buildings, not only for COVID, but for future uses. I'm just really grateful for the partnership at the city, both Jerry and Mark um, are obviously experts in what they do as are all of the facilities people in the city. Um, and we're just really grateful to have their partnership. And I just think it really provides a level of confidence that um, we are going above and beyond what other divisions are doing, but also, you know, what we would expect to support our students and our community here in Charlottesville. So thank you so much for your willingness to do that and the, you know, expenditure of money and resources other than money <laughs> um, to make sure that um, our buildings have this really high level of mitigation in it. So thank you. Any other board members, comments? And also thank you for coming to the meeting tonight. <laughs> Hopefully we didn't keep you too late. So, um, do we, we need to take action on this? Is that okay? That is the request. And then there is a brief one page update on transportation, but if you want to pause and take action now on the determination and notice, that would be great. Yeah, let's do that so that we can get Mark and Jerry off to their evenings. Um, anyone have a motion? Sure, I move that we approve the um, emergency authorization of um, funds for these um, units. And I second. Okay, thank you so much, y'all. Um, any questions or comments? 
Hearing none, I'll have Ms. Green do the vote. Okay, Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morseberger? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. Mr. Wade? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And then, um, so Ms. Powell, you're going to talk about transportation. Just a brief update. So this is another area, of course, where we partner closely with the city um, to serve the schools. And uh, transportation is currently transporting 58 students with special needs to and from 13 different locations or schools where they're receiving um, services. Um, they're using 10 vehicles, nine buses, and one van to provide this transportation. Driver turnover continues to be an issue. It's something we have a weekly... Um, transportation discussion as we've been planning for uh, increased in-person learning and one of the per, one of the constant updates is there just that the driver turnover is a persistent issue um, at this time the maximum students that can be transported per level is 200 and by level that means k4 and then walker and buford is a level and chs is a level so that would be 600 students total at this time based on capacity. One of, the, one of the moves that we have made to help free up capacity is that preschool will operate on a compressed schedule from 10 to 1.30 to free up capacity so that we can transport more preschoolers and also, of course, have the maximum buses that we can have rolling to transport the other students. Um, due to the persistent driver shortage, subcontracting with a third party for drivers would be necessary to increase capacity. That is something that our city transportation has been researching and we are planning for that to be a, an agenda item for the school board on November 19th. So you can hear more about that option then. And uh, last but not least, transportation will begin working on routes for buses based on the family intent forms received by November 13th. So that's just something that I wanted to, um, to remind everyone of or share because that routing process as was described to you, I think back in September, it's a it's an onerous process, and so at some point we have to give transportation some runway to get started on that. And so we, the November 13th deadline is is an important one. Um, after that date, certainly additional applications for transportation could be considered if as capacity is available. Um, and that's all I have for the board this evening. I'm happy to um, answer any other questions regarding our partnerships with the city as it relates to COVID operations. This might be a question for later, but for the maximum students at each level, the 200, so that's 200 for all the elementary schools, is there a policy for who gets priority or, you know, or is it just first come, first serve? Not first come, first serve. Um, we definitely want to look at it more through a lens of equity. There's going to be a process of division administration working with principals to help try to prioritize those applications as they come in um up through the 13th again there is a point where we've got to turn turn over our work to transportation so they can start their work but um we we do, we want to look at it in conjunction with the principals and look at need look at distance from schools you know really try to vet out does you know are where there are other options and where there aren't um and we also have been collaborating with kyle rodland in the city with safe routes to schools so when we get the forms in if we see um big areas of need. One of the first things we'll look at is, is there any alternative transportation solution that we could work with city safe routes to schools to get together to help address that area, such as bike trains, you know, getting bikes to students who need them and having them organize groups to get, you know, to bike to school or the walking school buses, you know. Uh, certainly, if someone is within a mile or less from a school, those are, those become more relevant options the further out you go those options become less viable and then we're gonna to need to look at need. Um, and so it's gonna be tricky. It, it's, um, I jokingly call it the hunger games of transportation, but there's nothing funny about it. It's, it's, a, it's a tough conversation every week as we contemplate how we're gonna face this challenge. Um, and we're hopeful that maybe the, the applications for bus transportation, maybe they won't be that high because we've been talking about it for so long. We're hope, hoping that a lot of families have already worked out other strategies, but we, we just don't know until we see the intent forms what the demand is going to look like versus what our capacity can handle at this time. Okay, so I just really need the parents to understand 
and advocates for parents, especially those maybe who have spoken at public comment, um, to really tell your families how important it is to get your applications in for um, and your family in your notice of intent by November 13th, the sooner the better. I'm not that this is a first come first serve, but I'm afraid we're going to miss families and I need our community to understand that November 13th is a hard deadline and we need to know if you need to have a bus uh, transport your child to school and need is very different than want and um, if you have infrastructure in your neighborhood like I don't know families that walk, routinely walk to school maybe you can your child can walk to school with that family that's different um, I think we, we definitely need to focus on alternative methods of transportation as a community. And we also need to make sure that our, our um, commuters understand that our children will be out there more than they normally are because we have reduced capacity in our buses. Um, so that we're going to be, you know, need our commuters and our um, car drivers in our city to be aware of students, of children walking to school. Um, or riding their bikes to school uh, and be more aware of that at once school opens. Um, I think this will help our whole community um, in the long run, um, but it is going to be a, a world of hurt initially to, because we definitely need to look at this through, the, uh, through an equity, equity lens. Um, and uh, we, we do know that, um, unfortunately, like the school board can't just uh, create um, walking buses, uh, that's really up to neighborhoods and PTOs, I think, and school level folks to, to, to work with their neighborhoods to get kids walking to school or riding um, their bikes to school. I remember Mr. Wade, when his child was young, they had a walking bus um, situation and he thinks so highly of that. But again, that wasn't a school led initiative. That was like a, you know, parents coming together. So. I know some schools, they're much more focused on that, whereas I think other schools are not. And so I just want to make sure that the community understands we do not have enough space in our school buses for ch all the children right now. We want your, you know, if we, if we open school now, we would not have that. Um, so we need to really focus on that. I'm sorry to go on a little rant there, but um, I just cannot emphasize it enough. <laughs> Madam Chair, also, I'll let you know that um, Denise Johnson and uh, Bianca Johnson, they are going to be doing outreach in the community the first part of next week prior to that November 13th deadline. So that we're, we're hopeful that that will help um, all, you know, reach all areas of the community. Just one more way to try to get out there and, and help families get those intent forms in. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I can't see anybody, so I was just really talking to this power our presentation. Um, does anybody else have any um, comments or um, questions? Yes, Dr. Kraft? Uh, yes, um, Ms. Powell, I, I'm wondering, um, I'd like to understand uh, the driver shortage issue. I'm wondering if there are any uh, aspects of that that are more unique to the pandemic environment that we're in, or if it's kind of the same, you know, concerns uh, that have always been there. Is there, but is there anything different now? And could that possibly improve once we are? I don't know. Well, could it possibly improve? <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah. The answer to your question is that it is. It is the driver driver shortage issue that's always existed, coupled with um, an additional loss of drivers because of health concerns. A lot of times, some of your best sources for drivers are retirees folks who are in that age group that they're automatically considered at a higher risk. So um, we have lost drivers who have been with the system for quite some time from what I understand who just simply, um, you know, are not going to take the risk at this point in their lives and, and that's understandable. And that is not unique to Charlottesville. That is in the headlines elsewhere in Texas, Pennsylvania. Um, so you can just Google bus driver shortage and you will, you will see um, the last time I did this back in September, the, there was current news from Oklahoma, a bunch of states, headline news in the, on the evening news. Um, so there's that. And then there's also a backup at DMV. 
uh, for new drivers coming through the pipeline. So we're getting squeezed at both ends. <laughs> you have more people leaving, um, you know, perhaps ending their careers, drivers maybe earlier than they would have otherwise. And then we've had a uh, bottleneck getting new drivers in the system because of um, the situation at DMV. Ms. McKeever, I'll yeah. also add that, that our community and families can go to our website and there is a form on our website to volunteer to help develop those safe routes to school and those walking routes to school. So we encourage our community to go to the website and complete those forms uh, if you'd like to help to um, develop a route to school for walking with our students. Great, thank you so much for um, having that on our website. Um, I understand Ms. Kadari has a question or comment. Yes, so Hi. how can families who do, who do not have the access to like um, the online form to have their voice heard of um, needing of assistance for the bus transfer, transportation? So that's where the community outreach that's happening early next week hopefully will will pay off, um, especially, you know, we knowing what parts of the community we the forms have been translated. My understanding is that Beth Chuck has um, translated everything. But I think it's just really important that we um, that the push that's going to happen in the early part of next week to get out in person and we can also um, You know, we're talking with principals about reaching out to families that who they think may um, have difficulty accessing the form. So it's a, it's a multi, like everything, layered or multi-pronged effort. Um, I won't say that any effort is perfect, but the intention and the thought, the thoughts about it are certainly there. And I'll also let you know that as the uh, intent forms, the responses are coming in, Beth Chuck, our communications officer, is uh, distributing that information out to our schools and to our principals. So they're benchmarking that against their database and they're keeping track of the families who have responded and making phone calls and making contact with those families who have not. And if they don't have access to the internet, we'll uh, deliver a hand, um, a, a paper copy of the survey out to them, the intent form, and we'll support them in any way that we can to complete those forms. Um, colleague just reminded me one very important way that we're pushing the forms out is with the meal distribution. Th um, thanks to the thank you, Dr. Odie, for reminding me about that because that is a way that we reach 700, 800 students a week, and so forms are going out with meals. So the forms that are going out are going out in both languages because you would have no way of knowing when when families come to pick up you because we have our forms in more than one language, more than one language form is going with the meals so that when they're picked up, if I'm a non-English speaking family, I could still read the information in the lunch packet. So I'll need to follow up with Beth Chuck to find out what of all the languages, how many different ones are going out with the meals because I can't say with confidence that everyone is covered. So that's a good question and I'll have to um, follow up on that. Emma, okay. if we have that information for you, uh, Ms. Perrier, it goes out in English and five other languages. Okay, because I, I just know that often the children will come to pick up the lunches, the older children, some of them may or may not have a parent. And so if you're giving out lunches, I may not know whether you speak Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, but if it was all in the packet, when I opened the packet, I could see the one that's my language. I know it's a probably, I hate to say this, but a waste of paper, but really not a waste of paper. But the other thing, um, Dr. Odie, Ms. Powell, and Dr. Atkins, I know that you said that um, Denise would be going out into the communities next week. Do you think by them going out next week that gives them enough time to meet that Friday deadline. I, I, if you are comfortable with it, I'm comfortable with it. I don't know how many people you're talking about, but um, I know that um, if they go out next week and the forms are due Friday, you miss announcements in your local houses of worship that may be happening Saturday and Sunday of this week. 
as a gentle reminder. And I know that we have um, a voicemail and an email from Beth, I believe, Chuck, not Baptist, about the importance of getting those forms in by the 13th. And I know you're doing everything humanly possible, but I'm just trying to make sure that we, as a collective, um, cover as many bases as possible. Those are good points. And um, we will consider that we have the 13th as the deadline. We ho hopefully most of the forms will be in by that time, but okay. it's not, we're gonna close the door. We'll still accept forms and we'll still work with families to make sure that we hear from all okay. of our families. Okay. So great points. Okay. Dr. Atkins, will they be um, touching base specifically with um, some of the partners, community partners who are doing instruction or holding you know, certain learning pods? Yes, yes. We're working with our community partners, Boys and Girls Club, all of the, we have a list of community partners who are working with our students. So we're working with them. And I said five languages, someone has just corrected me. There's six languages and they all go in the lunch bags that are going out to our families. Yes, great question. Okay, can we move on from transportation? Anybody else have any thoughts? Okay. Great. So the next um, item is the return to learn recommendations by Dr. Atkins. Thank you, Ms. McKeever. And um, next, uh, at the next board meeting, we will bring some additional information back to you about transportation once we have more information from the survey. So um, I want to start the presentation with a thank you to all of the uh, COVID advisory committee members and our community for all of the input that we've had around the topic of return to learn, the face-to-face -face portion of return to learn. Uh, thank you for your um, input and we all realize that we are in in the most difficult situation now our priority in the school system is to return our students to face-to-face -face learning in the safest our students and our staff in the safest manner possible at the most appropriate time and safety has to be our number one priority when considering returning to face-to-face -face learning so if we go to the next slide and look at a review of the guidance that uh, we are using in order to return to face-to-face uh, -face learning, we started out with phase one, March the 13th through September the 4th. Phase one put all of our students in virtual learning. In July of this year, our school board voted that we would open our school year with phase um, two which uh, is bit virtual learning, but also allows some of our students to come into the building for face-to-face -face instruction based on unique needs and IEP determinations. Now we are considering when would be the appropriate time to move to phase three, and that would be virtual learning for those families who opt to continue with the virtual learning and in-person face-to-face learning for the families who elect to return to the building. And then later, we will discuss phase four. Stakeholder input has been a major part of uh, the decisions uh, and uh, that I will be the recommendation that I will be making tonight. Uh, we convened an advisory um, COVID-19 advisory committee made up of parents, teachers, administrators, um, medical personnel, community members, a host of stakeholders to have input in three major areas of our return to face-to-face -face learning, uh, the elementary component, secondary component, uh, and the mitigation of facilities. This is an overview of some of the meetings that have occurred uh, with the COVID uh, advisory committee. Uh, three meetings, uh, two meetings in uh, September of the whole committee, September 23rd uh, and September the 20th. And then we had a, a meeting of the full committee to do some reporting out on October the 28th. On October the 14th, the uh, work groups of that committee uh, met to re give a report to uh, me on their recommendations. 
And then on October the 22nd, we invited the co-chairs of the work groups and the entire advisory committee uh, to present to our school board the recommendations that I'd received earlier um, in that week. Purpose of the COVID uh, advisory committee was to review the data regarding the uh, COVID-19 status in Charlottesville City. And they were responsible for looking at uh, data that went back to March and brought us all the way up to the current data in October uh, during the time that the committee was meeting. They also received and considered uh, any additional data that was coming out of the um, Blue Ridge Health District from the CDC or the Virginia uh, Department of Health. And we know that during September and October um, that there were a lot of transitions being made, a lot of additional information that was being generated by CDC and by the Virginia Department of Health and our own, own local health department. We also asked the committee to um, discuss potential options for opening face-to-face, -face, bringing our students back into the building, and then to recommend not only the model, but a timeline for returning face-to-face, -face. and then um, a process by which we would use to revisit um, the timeline and any decisions that we made on a regular uh, intentional basis. Recommendation from the COVID committee uh, for face-to-face -face learning for grades pre-K through six. Option one is to return to face-to-face -face learning four days per week with one day being virtual. Option two, uh, remain in the virtual model, which is five days per week virtual. The next recommendation was from the secondary group for grades seven through 12. Option one would be two days per week face-to-face -face with three days virtual or better known as the hybrid model. Option two, five days per week virtual as our students are currently. The committee also recommended a timeline for returning to face-to-face. -to -face. For our pre-K through six, the elementary cohort one, and that would be grades pre-K through one and grade five, would have a phased return during the week of January 11th, uh, 2021. Um, for details on that phase return, we can take a look at uh, the presentation that our principals made at the last school board meeting. The elementary cohort two would be grades two through four and grade six. They would also have a phased return week starting January 19th, uh, 2021. For our uh, secondary students, grades seven through 12, we would start returning uh, that group of students, uh, students who are new to our school division or new to the school um, for tours, tours and uh, orientation they would be put in groups A and group B. Group A would start returning to the building January 8th, and that would be for tour and orientation. And group B, their tour and or orientation would be January 15th, 2021. And that would be for our um, seventh grade students, eighth grade students, all the way through 12th grade students who are new to our school division, have, have not been in our schools, or students who are moving from one level to the next. So all of the seventh grade students uh, would be invited to um, return during those uh, tour orientation time periods and all of our uh, ninth grade students. The first day, official first day back for our secondary students would be February 1st. One of the considerations that uh, the, the advisory committee wanted to make sure that we did not lose sight of was mitigation. Wanted to make sure that we had all five of the CDC mitigation strategies firmly in place. 
um, and that we had um, the ability to monitor the incident rate, uh, I'm sorry, just the mitigation strategies that we had all of those in place. And then metrics that they wanted us to make sure that we um, continued to monitor and consider was the incident rate per 1,000 um, uh, citizens and then monitor the percent of positivity over a seven day period. Also create a COVID dashboard for our school division. And then make sure that um, the Blue Ridge Health District and the Virginia Department of Health can maintain a 90% contact tracing capacity and follow the Blue Ridge recommendations for closing due to transmission or outbreak should that happen um, once we come back face to face. So an update on where we are with the um, CDC recommend the five major recommendations from the CDC. If we look across all of our schools in the division for those five areas, consistent and correct use of the mask, we would be um, have a policy in place that would require that social distancing, hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfectant, uh, disinfection protocol and contact tracing. We see that we have already all of those items in place, uh, either through policy or through our procedures. Additional uh, strategies that we have in place for all of our schools uh, would be the uh, MERV filters. And as you heard uh, Ms. Powell's presentation, uh, there are about um, CHEM 5, HEPA filters, five to 10 HEPA filters um, that we still need to put at Clark. But other than that, uh, 10, nine. nine, thank you, uh, HEPA filters that we're still uh, needing to put in Clark, but all of the other school divisions have been completed. Um, the increased ventilation uh, with some of the, um, the uh, HEPA air purifiers, all of that will be in place. Uh, the portable monitors uh, and the um, HEPA filter units will all be in place by the end of December. The uh, UVC and bipolar ionization uh, technologies, we anticipate that that would be in place by the uh, completion of the first quarter. And the board has just given us permission to have the emergency declaration to order those pieces of equipment. One of the uh, recommendation also was that we create a CCS COVID dashboard. Uh, we currently have the community um, status dashboard and we can retrieve that from our Blue Ridge Health Department now. And we're in the process of creating a Charlottesville City Schools dashboard that will uh, show the incidence of transmission um, with our uh, employees and with students and we will give an, a regular update on that and that should be ready by December. Um, maintaining the 90% contact tracing, we've been assured by the health department that that is currently in place and uh, should remain in place for the foreseeable future. I have Beth Baptist here today and she's going to talk about the current data uh, as of today that we have from um, CDC on our incident rate and positivity rate. Beth. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Atkins. Uh, yes, this is the information that you've seen in another format earlier uh, based on the CDC risk metrics. The first column, the CDC incidents, this is the rate per 100,000 for the last 14 days. So it's a two week um, uh, factor. And you can see for us today, it was 201 and 6 tenths. Remember, this is a rate per 100,000. Charlottesville has less than 50,000 residents. So when you do the standardization, this number looks higher than the actual cases we have had. Um, red means we are at the highest risk right now. To move into the different areas, we would have to have, for the lowest area, only uh, four or five cases over a two-week period to get into the, the lowest risk, so it well, might be a while. Um, since we do have less than 100,000 residents, I also figure every day, 
what are the actual number of new cases in the last 14 days for Charlottesville. And if you look just over the last week, uh, it's been pretty consistent to go down. We're below 100 new cases over the past two weeks or the past two days in a row. That's the first time we've been below 100 since we started really looking at this uh, as closely in July. We also look at the uh, percent positivity for the last seven days as compared to the previous seven days. So our positivity rate right now is 1.0. I looked to make sure that was not a typo today. 1.0, that's the lowest it's been since we've been tracking. And then that last column looks at the percent change in our cases for the last seven days compared to the previous seven days. So you can see over the last five day, five, six days, we've had huge decreases in our overall transmission rate um, in the last week as compared to the week before. We had some pretty high numbers at one point, but things seem to have gone down, they've leveled out. And so tomorrow, based on what I think will happen, we may get to change that incidence column from red to orange, which will make me very happy to do that because it is showing that we are going down. So this is what we're looking at. I want to keep in mind the actual cases that we have, but then also look at what CDC has for our standardization, since that's how everybody is being looked at. So that's where we are for right now. I'd be glad to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Baptist. We'll take the questions in just a few moments. Okay. Um, our next slide is the incident survey. Uh, intent survey for our families. Um, we have sent that out that was mailed out to our families or online available to our families November the 3rd. And then the intent survey for staff will go out tomorrow. And both of those survey, intent surveys, uh, we anticipate getting those back November the 13th that will give us some important data in helping the board to make decisions about when to return face to face. So my recommendation to the board for returning face-to-face -face, uh, learning is to accept the models and the, the uh, return timeline as recommended by the COVID-19 Advisory Committee. Um, I would recommend for the next steps. Uh, back in July, the board voted to move us into phase two um, until the end of the first nine weeks. The first nine weeks will end on November the 16th. Um, and so I would uh, recommend that tonight that the board take action to extend phase two learning until the board uh, reconvenes on November the 19th. I also recommend that at the convening on the 19th that the board uh, take action, uh, discuss and take action on the recommendation of moving to phase three uh, at the timeline recommended by the, the uh, COVID committee. Also, I recommend that the, the board convene a meeting on December the 16th to review the metrics and to affirm or make adjustments to any action that you have taken with the phase three timeline, um, moving to phase three timeline. I'm happy to take any questions that the board might have. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. I recognize and honor all of the work that you've done and convening that uh, really that committee, very large committee of community members and staff and um, parents. And I just really appreciate you doing all of that. I know it was a lot of work and uh, your staff and you just put a ton of time into it. So thank you for all of your work around the um, that committee and then coming up with these recommendations. Um, it's, it's Absolutely. <laughs> and thanks to staff. I mean, they've done a great job in helping to um, keep the data fresh and to make sure that we have all of the facts that we need in order to, to make any decision or recommendation for returning to learn. Okay, who would like to begin first? Miss, um, I see no one. So I, I, I <laughs> go ahead, Dr. Kraft. Why not? <laughs> um, yeah, I'd also like to uh, thank everybody who has um, worked on this and the, the number of moving parts is astonishing. Uh, it really is. And um, 
Anyway, thank you very much. I feel like this is a serious, careful, well thought out plan. Um, so I feel good about it. Um, I, I had a question um, about, well, let's see how I can phrase this. All right, so it seems like the board, we have the option to, um, if we will approve this, let's say we approve it on November 19th, then uh, we have till December 16th to see if there are any, any changes in the, um, in the community, in the situation with the pandemic in our community, and we might be able to make adjustments. Um, but it seems like both families and staff do not have that flexibility uh, so that, you know, they have to return their intent forms <clears throat> by, you know, a week from tomorrow and sort of, as I understand it, that's sort of it for the year. So if things changed and they felt differently, um, you know, is there any flexibility there, you know, for them to change their preferences? And I guess that would include, you know, staff maybe, uh, you know, changing their preferences based on their comfort level, but it also for families, um, you know, if, let's just say that they've opted for virtual learning um, and then, you know, based on the, the situation in the community, they realize that it's safer than they thought and they would like to opt in to the face-to-face. -face. Are there any options? Are there, is there any flexibility for that kind of thing built in? Dr. Kraft, I, I appreciate you making the comment when you started asking that question about the complexity uh, and all of the moving parts in, in this incredibly difficult time. Uh, one of the uh, um, challenges that we face in receiving the information about the intent is that that information will be used to develop the master schedule and to align staffing. Now, we have our our staff members and our teachers who are going to be sending in their intent form about whether or not they would like to remain virtual, they have a medical need, or they have a request to remain virtual or to come in face to face. We're going to try to match up those requests with the intents and the requests that we're getting from our families for face to face and for virtual. Once we make those adjustments, uh, it may cause us to change uh, teacher assignments. It may cause us to change quite a bit of the operations in our building. And once we do that and that's in, in place, uh, because of COVID, we won't have the same flexibility that we would have during non-COVID times. So allowing families to make a switch would cause us to have to go back in and adjust all of those structures in order to accommodate that switch. And that would be very disruptive, very difficult uh, for the operation of the school and uh, the face-to-face -face learning. So we're asking families to be very careful about making the decision and their intent uh, so that we can factor that into all of our scheduling. Um, our structures will not be as flexible as we would want them to be, and most of that is due to COVID. Um, so making changes and switches would be a huge challenge for us. Dr. Atkins, real quickly on that same topic, if you don't mind, excuse me, Dr. Kraft, I don't, I'm not sure if you were done. Um, so totally makes sense as far as um, locking into a decision and, um, you know, with a family or a student choosing to go virtual and then feeling like, oh, I'd like to come back and do face to face. Is there not flexibility for a family who chooses face to face and then for some um, personal reason, medical reason, whatever, the family opts or decides that, that they need to have their, their student at home. Is there flexibility to go that direction um, with a waiting list of students potentially that to fill a spot? Yeah, we will always uh, handle individual cases. That's a great point. What we want to try to avoid 
um, is families opting for the face-to-face -face, knowing that they can make the switch to virtual at any time uh, because we don't want to overstaff the face-to-face -face and then have a significant number of our students to move from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual because that would then require us to move more staff into the virtual environment. So we're trying to help our families to understand uh, the significant hurdle that our principals and our teachers and our staff are going to have to undertake uh, the complexity of developing schedules and making everyone's intent and desire um, a reality uh, in our scheduling, uh, that they carefully think about it and make a selection and, and for the most part, not have to switch um, during this, that semester from January through June. But if there are emergencies that come up, certainly we're going to work with our families uh, on an individual basis for those. That, make, that makes sense. And thank you for sharing that with the public. One of the concerns that our families have expressed and our teachers is that um, moving from virtual to face-to-face, -to -face, uh, there's a real possibility that we might have to re-roster some of our students. And if we have to do that, we only want to do that once. But if we allow families to make another switch later, it could cause us to have to do a second re-roster and we want to minimize the disruption and the changes that our students and our teachers will have to encounter during this time. Perya? Um, Dr. Atkins, um, excellent explanation. But in having everyone make their decisions by November 13th, that would also help guide us on November 19th because depending on what you get on the 13th, what you have presented this evening may need a little tweaking or adjustment by the 19th. So I appreciate Dr. Kraft's concern, um, but I saw it differently. If you have this block of information on November 13th, then on November 19th, uh, board, this is the information we've gathered, this is what we've put together, so that when we're having those discussions on November 19th, we've got as much information as we can in order to do what we need to do as it relates to phase three. Yeah, phase three. Is that right? Am I right? Excellent point, Ms. Per year. You okay. are, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the intent form and we schedule it so we can get timely information um, back to the board so that you can consider that as you're discussing uh, the recommendation. Um, can I ask a quick question? Uh, for the, the November 13th cutoff, um, my concern about that, and I understand you need to iron down things, but uh, a few factors that are playing into it. So the transportation logistics, families might need to opt, like they might need to change once they find out if there's even space available on transportation. So we won't know about transportation, you know, the 13th is the date for transportation and for you to tell us what you wanna do, but you might not know about the transportation situation. And also for teachers filling out their intent forms, um, if there's any outstanding requests uh, for special accommodations, they won't have the answer by then. So they, their answer, might need to change based on if they do get an accommodation or they have a, um, a medical condition that gets approved. So there, it seems like there needs to be some flexibility in those cases where the, you can't make all the choices with the information that you have. I, and that's, that's Ms. Morsberger, that's a great point um, that even after the 13th, uh, there are going to be individual cases that we will have to consider with our staff and with our families. But when we receive the information on the 13th, that will give us great guidance on how many seats are actually being requested 
uh, with the current capacity that we have with transportation. Uh, if we have to subcontract with drivers, it will help us to know how many drivers might we need if we subcontracted. It would also help us to know how many teachers, how many staff members are requesting for medical purposes to be virtual and how many of them are requesting to be virtual because they have um, a, someone living in their household that falls into a risk category or someone who lives outside of their household that's an immediate family member who's in a risk category. Those bits of information are essential to us in order to make decisions. Um, after the 13th, if there's a staff member that needs to make an adjustment, we're going to handle that on an individual basis and be able to work with them. HR has already started to process some of the uh, applications that have come in, some of the requests for teaching virtually. I think we've received 34 requests as of today. The, the vast majority of those have come during the month of uh, October. I anticipate when the board takes action, if the board actually votes for uh, us to return face to face, the number of requests that we're going to receive will increase and we'll be processing all of those. So what's the timeline for the processing? If you put in your request, when will you hear back? A quick turnaround. It depends on uh, the documentation that comes in with the request. Um, Dr. Hubbard, do you want to answer that? Yes, um, what we've been communicating with um, staff members that have made their requests now is that we would let them know four weeks before a decision was made as to what the learning model would be. So if the board takes action and chooses the learning model uh, for the face-to-face -to, -face to start in January, then um, people who have put in requests could expect to start receiving those requests, uh, whether they're approved, denied, on uh, roughly right around the beginning of December. Then as more requests come in, we would then take those and, and process them. And sometimes we need more information. Sometimes we have all the information we need and then we'd be able to move forward from that point. But depending on what the move is, if the board adopts the January return, then we would start sending out the, um, the documentation to staff members that their request was approved uh, at the beginning of December, which would so give us about four weeks. So you would advise someone if you have a request pending that you're requesting accommodation that on the survey, you should say that you would prefer to be virtual or not to return if you're a member of staff so that you're locked because you're going to be locked into what you say, even though you don't know the, you know, if your request has been approved or denied. Well, the people that have already placed their request in, um, if they fill out the survey, we would probably see that, be able to cross-reference and be able to then answer them individually as we were going to in um, anyway. So I don't, I don't think that'll be that big of a, of, of a problem for us. And Ms. Barnes and Morrisberger, for our staff members, uh, we just need the information back. We're not saying to our staff members that whatever you put on that form, that's what you're going to have to live by for the rest of the school year. What that form will give us is what you are requesting. Uh, we know that we will re uh, process all of the medical requests and we will respond to that. Uh, for those requests that are not medical requests, we have to handle those uh, in light of how many of our families ask for virtual learning or face-to-face -face learning and make the, the matches between staff and the requests from our families. So they're not being locked into it. Uh, they're making a request and we're gonna to respond to that request. Okay. And then on the form, is there an option for them to add in? Like, I know you're saying like they can ask, they pick, I don't know if it's yes, no, but is there a, a place where they can write in what the factors are or what the concern is so that you have that part going in as well? We do, yes. There's an opportunity for them to give us specific information if they would like to. The form will go directly to HR. It doesn't go through anyone else's hands so that they can feel, our uh, staff can feel comfortable uh, putting health information on that form if they would like to. They don't have to. 
uh, if they're asking for medical consideration under one of the categories that's listed on the form. And there's some documentation that HR will, will ask them to bring in and, and that those documents are, or the documentation that will be required is listed on the form and HR will help them walk through that. Okay, and then another question um, is about the face-to-face -face learning. Um, right now, at least for the elementary school, when you're virtual, your asynchronous time where you're face to face with the teacher versus, no, 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 you're synchronous, which when you're face to face with the teacher, the teacher's there and then there's your independent time and it's not a pre-recorded, like it's, it's not like just a, a recording of the classroom. It's like a, an assignment for you to do. So when we go face to face, will we be recording like if you opt to stay virtual and there's a lab or something at the high school are are you recording the live face-to-face -face, uh classroom sessions for later viewing or are the virtual students getting like a separate like what they would get if we were all virtual versus what some people get in the classroom what i can tell you is that the quality of the face-to-face -face now I, uh, many of our families have spoken about they appreciate the quality and the depth that our teachers have taken in order to develop very interesting and comprehensive lessons that's been wonderful as we move to face to face our intent is that the face to face the quality of the face to face learning uh, will meet a, a high bar of excellence and we will maintain the same quality of excellence with our virtual learning that we currently have. We don't intend to diminish uh, one over the other. Uh, whether or not a teacher chooses, who's teaching virtually, chooses to record a lab, um, and that's going to be the teacher's decision. Uh, depending on how many requests we have for virtual and at each level, and how many staff members we have requesting virtual, as we're make, making those uh, matches, uh, we're hoping that a teacher will either teach virtual or teach face-to-face, -face, and they're not teaching both. That's considered a hybrid model, and they're not teaching both. So we, we want to be very careful with how we lay it out uh, in order not to overly burden our teachers at the high school um, during the non-face-to-face -face time. Uh, much of that will be assignments. Much of that will be um, research um, that the students will be engaged in. Uh, and then there will be office times that the students can uh, schedule for uh, meeting with their teacher. Okay. And then I'm going to keep going. Just, I have a lot of questions. So, and then for the timing versus face-to-face -face versus virtual, because right now we start a little later and that's working. But if we go back face-to-face, -face, I know a lot of the preschools or daycares start later. So will the virtual versus the face-to-face -face have different start times? That's, that's very possible. As we look at transportation and the schedules, we have not um, nailed down the times for both of those and synchronized those times. Um, but that will be our next step to work on those times. Okay. And then will grading work the same uh, virtual versus in-person? Like if you're virtual, do you have the same type of assignment? Like does, is there any thought going into how grading will look different for people who are virtual versus in-person? Mm -hmm. Teachers will be working on that. Um, they will still be meeting in their uh, PLCs and our virtual teachers and our face-to-face -face teachers will continue to meet and collaborate and plan together to make sure there's continuity between what's happening in the virtual model and what's happening in the face-to-face -face model. Standards are going to be the same, um, so we want to make sure that there's continuity back and forth between those two models. Okay, and then this is kind of two-in-one. Um, if you are a teacher and you are the only teacher in that subject, I think they gave me some examples of a certain Spanish in the high school or engineering. If you are a teacher who teaches one of those or a kid that takes one of those classes and the teacher is virtual, but you're in person, what is, will there be an additional person hired to teach in person? Does that student do virtual for that one particular class? And, 
And I'm not going to be able to give you a specific response to that question, but th those are the details that we will work out. That's our next step of um, scheduling and management once we get the information back from our families. And Dr. Odie or um, I can, anything you want to add to that? Um, Dr. Atkins, I can uh, chime in. And uh, there are cases such as that where uh, teachers hold certain certifications. And, uh, and so we've been working with uh, Dr. Irizarry about how that would look. Uh, it's possible that, uh, for instance, if a, a teacher that holds a specific certification is teaching in person, uh, then the students would be able to log in and, and watch the class virtually. Uh, we want to make sure that we are um, meeting the needs of those students that need that course, um, but without the option of another person teaching it because of the certification requirements, uh, we're going to have to be creative and make sure that we, we have opportunities for that to occur. But we haven't finalized any um, of those specific details, but we know that that will be something that we need to work on. Okay, and then let's say that ends up being an issue. If you're a teacher and you end up having to do, you know, if you're a teacher who teaches one subject and something like that happens or you have to help in an event of a shortage, do teachers, are they going to be paid for overload or overtime if they end up having to take on an extra class or anything like that? Or, you know, because of issues like that or challenges where you might need someone in person and someone virtual? Um, last year, the board uh, passed um, some guidance on uh, how we might compensate our students. We had a, a task force that came together made up of our teachers to talk about when teachers have to take on additional responsibilities. So we have uh, renewed that process and uh, the procedures for how we compensate our teachers for taking on additional responsibilities. Um, uh, Kim Powell has worked with HR and uh, we have a process that's in place, procedure that's in place to compensate our families, uh, uh, excuse me, our teachers as they have to take on additional responsibilities. Okay. If they're teaching a, an additional section, um, that would follow the same procedures that it has followed um, during non-COVID times. Okay. Okay, that's, that's, those were my questions about just the, those special classes where, you know, there's only one teacher and so you have in-person and virtual. I just want to make sure that we had like a, a approach to that that was clear for the teachers. Um, so if we could find out, I know everything's complicated, but if we could get some more information on what that might look like, um, uh, that would be good. And then I got a lot of questions about uh, from people about the requests for the accommodations that uh, to HR about the turnaround times because I know you got a lot in October but um, there are ones that came in during the original or over the summer and um, there's concern about when the so you're saying everyone should get a notice December 1st if they had a medical request for an accommodation. Yes, once the board makes the decision as to what model we'll go with, four weeks prior to anyone coming back, we will send out letters to all of the 31 requests that we have right now um, on file. They will be communicated with. And some teachers who put requests in early have communicated with HR and I've had individual conversations with them so that has been going on uh, along the way. So we've been keeping everyone very well informed when they've called and asked. And but it hasn't been approved. It's they're pending until December. Yeah, 1st. we'll send out what it is in December. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're and welcome. then Bryson Morrisberger, we want to be careful that we don't approve it too early, because there are a limited number of weeks uh, with the medical um, uh, uh, teleworking. Uh, for medical reasons. So we want to make sure while the teachers are teaching virtually now, uh, there's not a reason for them to um, receive the accommodation. So we want to make sure that when we uh, offer that accommodation, it does align with 
a need to come back in the building face to face because the accommodation is allowing the teacher uh, to teach virtually and not come back into the building. So for our special education teachers who are being asked to come back now, we are processing that. For teachers who are not special education are not coming back in the building or being required to come back in the building now, we want to make sure that we um, consider that in um, sending out the approval letters to them and that their medical um, documentation takes that into consideration also. Okay, and this is really my final question for now, I think. For um, the, the like uh, SPED, ESL, um, and maybe even for the elementaries, I've noticed um, the since Albemarle announced that they are going back in person, there's been a lot of openings for those types of positions. I don't know if it's a turnover. I don't know if it's because they need more support in the classroom. And so I'm just wondering for like, you know, special needs or English as a second language, under, under, under good circumstances, you know, like we need lots of support in the classroom. So under COVID, I would anticipate we need um, more. So is there any talk or discussion about additional support for SPED classrooms that are in person or English as a second language um, learners um, for the, you know, for the classroom support for the students and the teachers when they're in person. So Dr. Lee has, has um, you want to chime in on that? Well, right now, um, there has not been a need for additional support in special education. Um, we've been able to support the students um, that have individual needs to come in for face-to-face. -face. Um, that doesn't mean that in the future that that may not um, arise, that need may not arise. But right now, we have not gotten to that point. Um, we need additional staff. But right now, they're staggered. Like if we go face-to-face, -face, it would be like more people at one time or like, you know, during, yeah. Right now, right, that we are staggered right now with this small amount of students coming in receiving okay. face to face services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Any other, Ms. Prayer? So, Dr. Atkins, help me understand. There are a small group of people that have had to come in because of the special categories. And we've done that on a case by case basis. So they are not covered. No, that's not the right word. They are not restricted by the guidelines you just spoke about. You, know, you said there was a time frame. So in other words, if I send you a request to HR today and I'm in the high school and we have a tentative date to return, I will be notified 30 days prior to that if my request has been granted. However, if I'm currently one of the people that had to come in to do this select group of students, maybe one child or no more than two. But now because we are talking about phase three, I make a request. My request goes in with the phase three request, not with what's happening now. Am I am I making so I think I think what you're asking, Ms. Perrier, is the teachers that are coming back for face-to-face -face instruction right now with small groups of special education students, if they're making a request, are we following the same four-week time frame with honoring their request? There you go. The I'm sorry, to... Dr. Atkins. I just didn't understand. Thank you. Oh, it's so much. I say I stay so confused. Okay. That not fully understood what you were saying. Okay. And to answer your question, we are answering those on a case-by-case -case basis as they come in. So okay. no, they are not waiting the four week time frame. The ones that we get in, once we have all of the documentation, we then process that request and we communicate with the staff member um, immediately. Okay. So we don't, we're not waiting on those. Okay, I understand. 
Thank, thank you both. I, it, it, it's just a lot to try to process and we're all trying to get it right. So just thank you for bearing with me. Absolutely. And I will say uh, in all of our communications that we've sent out to our staff, the Family First uh, Coronavirus Act does expire December 31st. However, our staff can still make a request for an accommodation uh, based on family medical leave or some other policy that we currently have in our school division. Uh, but one of them will expire in December. Um, we, I, we don't know if that will be renewed, but there is still there are still other opportunities for our staff members to apply for an accommodation. If it expires in December, does that mean if you're approved before December, your request is fine? Or does it mean that if you were applying anything COVID related under that Families First Act that you need to update it if you want it in the new year? Well, it ex since it expires December 31st, mm -hmm. there, there is no, we, we don't have the flexibility to update that federal act. So if, if federal legislation comes down and extends it or the state extends it, then we'll definitely honor that. But as of right now, that, that act expires December 31st. So really for us as a school district, you could say that act expires December 18th because that's our last day in school. So then coming back in January, we'd be looking at if teachers had put in from, that's why the survey is so important. When teachers put in the information in the survey and they have medical conditions and other related um, um, concerns, we can then look to match it up with the need from the students. The, the, it's kind of like basic supply and demand. The supply of the teachers, the demand of the students, and then we'll make, we'll make decisions based on what people have asked for. But the FFCRA does expire December 31st, which for us is December 18th, because that's our last day of school, which is why the students who are back face to face with um, special education teachers, we're acting on those as they come in and we have all the documentation. Can I just follow up on that, Dr. Hubbard? Um, from what you're saying, um, once this act expires, does that then um, restrict our division's ability, uh, the criteria that we can use to approve uh, a staff request for leave? Are we then, you know, are our hands tied after that uh, more than they are now? Well, I wouldn't say our hands are, are they're tied to a certain extent because one of the request, one of the conditions is a child care situation or COVID closure. So with the, with the um, act expiring, COVID closure would go away. Medical, you can always apply through our FMLA, our Family Medical Leave Act policies. So then we would also look at other mitigating circumstances and look at what the request is and what the need is. And we're going to my team is ready to work as hard as we possibly need to, to match those things up and put people in the right places and have, have the staff feeling comfortable and protected as well as still meeting the needs of our general public. I know you're going to do that. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Dr. I would just like to add though, that um, the hit, like we as a board can create policies that make it like, like that would, would also be, uh, similar to the law. So our board makes these policies too. Like we can, we can mimic the law saying, we know that, for example, depending on the, you know, what happens in the, in the, in the Congress for the next month and a half, maybe there's not a, a, a you know, a, a, a bill that passes that extends the, the um, Coronavirus Relief Act, but we can certainly say, no, our policy now is that relief act and extend it as long as we want because that's what we can do as elected officials. So we have that um, ability to do that. I just want you to be clear about that. It's not just our hands are tied. Maybe Dr. Hubbard's hands are tied. As a board, we're going to follow state and federal law and then we can, um, we can also, our hands are not tied in that same way. Yeah, I, I would really like us to, to look at that closely and, and to be forward thinking 
as far as having something or policies to look at that, that we could you know, implement rather quickly if that is not renewed. Um, I know that the FMLA is 12 weeks and that's kind of, you know, that's depending on um, when we return face to face, you know, that, that could not cover um, the full amount of, of instructional time that a teacher might, you know, be expected to be back in the building. So I, I personally would really like us to have something to, to look at or lined up um, to be more supportive of, of that or to put in place of that if possible, if that makes sense. Ms. Torres, we certainly can bring a, a proposed policy to you. Uh, I think we can probably get one ready by uh, the December uh, meeting. Um, it would not, even if it expired, it doesn't expire until the 31st of December. And we can certainly continue to process uh, whole responses until the board meets um, to take action on anything like that. But we certainly can bring a policy before the board. If everybody well, hopefully is it's all, that, great. Hopefully it becomes all irrelevant though. I mean, you know, but. Correct. Yeah. Dr. Atkins. Mr. Bryant, go ahead. Sir. Yes, um, Doctor, I had a quick question. Um, if for an example, a uh, teacher or staff member's application for accommodations is denied, um, what options do they have um, to appeal that decision? If we go back to the supply and demand, um, for medical reasons, uh, that's pretty laid out. Um, and, and usually you, you're going to get a doctor certification uh, that you will bring in that helps to guide us in our decision making. So I'll move the medical part uh, over to the side. So those are pretty clear. Um, the other accommodations would be uh, because of a desire that a family has or that a, a staff member has. And they're going to tell us about that. They're going to tell us what they're designed. So that, that supply and demand comes into play there, matching up our staff with what our families are requesting. Uh, and we're going to really work hard to try to do as much of that matching as we possibly can. Um, what we know about this situation is that our staff members are going to have needs and they will be unique needs that they will have, um, that we will have to sit and we'll have to talk and gather information. Our families will also have needs. So it's a, a, a difficult situation for both groups, but it's an opportunity for us to respond to both our sets of needs by making matches. And that's what we will be looking to do. Thank you. For a uh, good question, so for teachers or I guess any administrators or students who did have COVID but don't have it anymore, is there a restriction for them coming back to school if there is an option face-to-face -face learning? That is a great question. So the CDC uh, has guidelines for how to quarantine, how many days to be quarantined, and guidelines for retesting uh, to have a negative test prior to going about it, uh, engaging in the general population. So once a student has followed those guidelines and has tested uh, negative, then a student may opt to come back after they followed all of those guidelines, come back face, come into a face-to-face -face model. Okay, thank you. Dr. Atkins, are there any um, requirements as it relates to students and staff once the hybrid model starts for a time frame for them to have tested negative or do they just come and you do the temperature check and if the temperature is okay they come in you know are so are we required to have a COVID test either students or staff members, you know, anyone in the building, that includes the instructors and everybody else, uh, and the bus drivers, yada, yada, or do we, are we making the uh, presumption that everyone is coming in COVID-free and moving from there? What's our benchmark? It's a great question. Dr. Baptist, I'm going to ask you to, um, she's been working on the protocol for that. Okay. Uh, 
Well, we can certainly do testing, but if testing really only tells you a point in time, you know, where people were at that point. We have had an attestation form that has gone out to uh, all of the staff. We've had a form that's going out to all of the families that is a self check that when parents sign that or staff members sign that, that says that they have agreed to do the self checks about you know, have you had fever, have you had cough, you know, all the, the list of symptoms that CDC and health department recommend. And then when students arrive on school property or, or go to a school bus, they will have temperatures checked at that point. So, and, and as people come in the building, we've got thermometers around our buildings now that once you come in, it will be checked. And then we've got certain protocol that we're writing to um, take care of situations where someone starts to get sick once they're at school. So we won't be doing a full self check every day, but once people sign the attestation that, that they will do it, then the faith and hope is that they are following that and we will do um, temperature checks at school. And Dr. Baptist is working with Dr. Luna uh, now to, uh, you want to go into a little bit of that detail, although we don't have all of it. We don't have all of it. Dr. Luna is at UVA and um, is very interested in doing testing at various sites. Uh, as we'll be working with testing within school sites here in the city and in the county. And so we're trying to get some um, uh, guidelines together about how those testing events would occur, how many testing events we would be able to, to have, who we uh, from Charlottesville City Schools we would be able to have there. And Dr. Adkins, I didn't get a chance to tell you this. I asked what type of test it would be. <laughs> they are doing the PCR test. And I said, oh, no, that was terrible. And he said, oh, did you have it nose or throat? And I said, I had it nose. He said, yeah, that is pretty uncomfortable. I said, well, what are the chances that we might could have the saliva test? He says, we'll talk about it. So we are going to work to try to get a testing protocol that is recommended by UVA and with the health department and we'll kind of follow their guidance and would like to do something in December before people get away from us for the holidays and then do something in early January when people come back in case they have been traveling um, during the holiday. So more to come on that. We're just getting started with those conversations. Thank you, Dr. Baptist. Um, Madam Chad has had a, a couple of questions or comments and um, Jennifer, I'm glad that you mentioned um, earlier about um, transportation and if, and if you have the capacity in your neighborhood to, you know, walk with others if they're doing it, um, then that's a, a good option. Um, but um, I heard it tonight and I've heard it um, in reading as well. I read it in reading about we're coming back at the beginning of January and a lot of people would be um, potentially been been doing some traveling or visiting and and then right after we're coming back into schools but I'm thinking what Beth just talked about Dr. Baptist just talked about could um, address some of my concerns that you know they're going to sign up to say that they're going to take these kind of self-assessments and we're going to have some things in school to take temperatures and things like that but has the all of the CDC guidelines and things that y'all have been looking at has that factored in like potential high number of students and teachers and faculty, um, you know, may have gone out the area? If we look at doing some of the community testing, like we just talked about, one thing Dr. Luna would like to be able to see is if we went to one of our schools and had people from that neighborhood come and we had a higher percentage of uh, positivity rates there that that might show us uh, how certain neighborhoods have been beh not behaving but how they've been interacting with others. Uh, I also know from being in a, a faculty meeting at UVA that they're going to be doing testing of the UVA students as they leave town after Thanksgiving or for Thanksgiving and when they come back. So you know, while we're concerned about the people who are right in Charlottesville City Schools, we're also concerned about other people within the community who have been traveling. So if students, uh, UVA students are also getting tested, then hopefully we'll be able to 
look at various neighborhoods there too and catch areas that could be higher transmission before there is a problem. Dr. Ideally, we would be conducting that test um, immediately when we return and that would be prior to January 11th. So we have a good data set to um, look at prior to opening on the 11th if the board approves that. Just, just as an FYI for the community, if I may too, I mean, if you're paying attention to recent publications and recommendations from uh, the American Academy of Pediatricians and, and other um, medical groups. I mean, everybody really is strongly recommending that people limit or try not to travel um, as, as tough as that is. And as much as we all are missing um, family members and friends, um, but that really is kind of best practice at this point in time. So I think we need to, we need to say that. Indeed we do. In fact, that's what they recommended, the mitigation committee recommended um, that we do a PR campaign, basically asking people to stay in um, and not travel over the holidays. So um, at the same time, until we have some federal leadership that indicates that we need to be masked and socially distant and washing our hands and um, avoiding large crowds, it's gonna be hard on our little lo local level to really um, expect that our community will do that. But we really do hope that you will. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions about this recommendation? I have a few more questions. Oh, someone else can go. Ms. I don't have any. Okay, have go any. ahead, Ms. Morrison, Ms. Morseberger. Uh, the question, oh, we're talking about working with the health district and the kind of tests that they have. Is there any way we could set up some direct contact so that if there is an issue in a school or where we might have a pod that's been exposed where we can have some direct person that we refer people to or a direct site, is there any way we can work that out with the health district? And then the other question goes back, I'm just getting it out so I won't forget. If you're a high school student and you opt to go back in person, the two days face to face, are your other three days of virtual learning face to face, like is it, Hold on, what's the word? Synchronous. Is it, is it live and in person? Or are your other three days asynchronous? Uh, Ms. Morrisberger, let us get the, the exact information and how they're going to arrange their schedules and we'll bring it to you on the 19th. We'll give you more information. Um, the high school did a presentation at our last board meeting on uh, some of their schedule, but we'll get a little more uh, detail on how they're going to arrange that. Okay, and then can we find out if there's some direct contact we can make with the top or the Blue Ridge Health District about like if we do have a case or a possible exposure, is there like a direct place we can send people to um, for testing, you know, like that we have a contact um, of someone there so that, you know, there some people will have access or know where to go to get tested. Dr. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We have a, a contact that we use um, at the health department and then a couple of backup people if we cannot reach our contact. They may not recommend at that point to get someone tested. We would probably recommend that they uh, check with their health care provider to see if that testing is needed right then. If you test too early after you've been exposed, you're likely to get a negative. So you really need to wait, which is a problem. Uh, need to wait a few days so that it will show up as positive. So we would have to uh, get the health department to help us with the contact tracing to see when was the exposure, how, you know, really what was the exposure. But yes, we've got several people at the health department that we can call day or night and uh, we meet with them weekly. So um, we've been able to develop a relationship with people there that we could contact for any sort of outbreak or individual case. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I just offer this little bit of, um, because, you know, I have a 11th grader and a 12th grader um, in addition to my elementary school kids. And I don't presume to know that their experience is everybody's experience by any, um, by any stretch. Um, but I have talked to other parents and it seems to be going pretty well for some of these children 
in the in the virtual high school experience. Um, and I just wonder and would ask that we allow the high school to be as flexible and um, as possible. Um, like I understand like engineering, fine arts, like there are definitely classes that you want to have in person. Um, but I wonder if we could, um, you know, I wonder what we could build um, that would, because I know a lot of, I don't know, 10th, 11th and 12th graders who are relieved not to have the social aspects of high school <laughs> um, and who are really working very well in this um, environment. And so it, it really does provide this very difficult choice for parents. Um, you know, obviously, I just, I just would like the, there to be some school-based flexibility um, that like, while I appreciate Ms. Bryce and Borisberger's questions because it does provide some opportunity to suggest there might be some flexibility there that we aren't thinking of. And that I would just like as a board to also suggest, you know, if we could minimize you know, can have the good parts and 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 have of, of each of virtual and um, in person. So anyway, I just I just think there should be some flexibility there. Um, so I know that's a nightmare scheduling wise, but um, I I definitely think that some high schoolers are. Do I mean, I think ninth graders that's a real challenge, and some tenth graders that's a real challenge. But I think once you're in eleventh and twelfth grade, unless you have special needs or some, you know, like you're in charge of your own academic career at that point. And you really, you know, sometimes the social aspects really undermine you academically. So anyway, I just want to also offer that as a voice. Um, and that's, I don't have any questions about it, but go ahead. Who, who has a question? Ms. Um, Madam Chair, yeah, just, um, I know, so back to the situation of a student who may um, have to uh, quarantine for a while while they're waiting and say it's a student who has opted for the face-to-face -face option. Um, I know in, a, in the college setting when that's happening, um, the college has been very ac accommodating, you know, and, and just rolling those students right into um, an online type of uh, platform or format so that they don't miss classes. Have, have, has that been discussed? Ms. Torres, it hasn't been discussed per se, but I can assure you uh, that as we're thinking about coming back face to face, uh, we would be doing everything that we can to accommodate our students who, um, for whatever reason or in whatever circumstance, uh, faces an illness, be it from COVID or anything else. Um, that causes them to have to move from face to face to online. We certainly will work with that family and accommodate that family. Yeah, great. Thank you. Students. Absolutely. I think the, the, um, the, the optimal word is flexibility with this. There are some structures that we have to put in place, but beyond that, flexibility is going to, it will be what will make this successful. Um, and help us to manage and move through January through June uh, in the smoothest way possible. Flexibility with our staff and flexibility with our students and families. From a student's perspective who has talked to um, many high school students, um, many of them have said to me that they want a, an easier transition if like uh, they wanted to option out of like face-to-face uh, -face learning and we lost you um miss kadari miss kadari we lost you and your voice your sound i'm thinking maybe i'm the only one am i the <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, Ms. Kadari, can you, can you, can no, you, we lost her sound. <laughs> can, can you repeat what you just said? Because obviously we are on the edge of our seat. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so I was saying from a student's point of view has talked to many um, high school students, my fellow um, classmates, many of us are 
um, you know, stress out about whether if like, if we do go to face to face, um, we don't want that transition from like, well, like, what, well, what if like, I want to go back to virtual learning, like, I don't want to have to worry about like the, the heart transition. So the flexibility, like, I think it's a huge um, factor. Thank you, Ms. Kadari. I appreciate your comments. We'll keep that in mind, for sure. And I know Dr. I is working on that uh, right now, he and, and his counselors. Um, okay. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Atkins? Okay. Um, do you have any final words, Ms. Dr. Atkins? No, I, I again just want to say thank you to all of the committee members and, and teachers and staff. Um, again, safety is our priority and making sure that we respond to the needs of our students and our staff um, and getting through this incredibly difficult time um, in the safest way possible is, is certainly a priority. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. I also want to say thank you to all of the um, committee members, but also all of the staff who are doing the work every single day in virtual environment. It's, it is really humbling and, and inspiring to see um, the great work that's happening um, as, as you know, that we have been able to do virtually. So thank you to all of you as well. Um, but moving on to, um, does anybody have any responses or questions about the written report? Um, which was uh, the pupil-teacher pupil ratio. Okay. And now we're gonna go back to comments from the community. Um, Mr. Cuomo, do you have anybody signed up? I do. I have uh, Beth Ike who would like to speak and I've unmuted her or given her the ability to unmute, so. Okay, we also have Ben, um, Alva, we, the school board welcomes public comment. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Um, and welcome, Ms. Ike. Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone again for all of your hard work. It's so appreciated. Um, I wanted to say a couple things. I really appreciate the plan put forth having the um, December 16th date so the board will be able to change course um, should the risk feel too great to return in January. Um, should the risk be really different then than it is now? Because um, now it seems like CCS is full steam ahead to return in January. Um, I know we have kind of a chicken or the egg problem or a supply and demand problem with figuring out what return looks like in the absence of knowing who's returning. But I worry about folks answering the surveys, both the families answering the surveys or the staff answering the surveys about a, a binding intent form when we really have so little clue what the granularity looks like. Yes, transmission mitigation is, well, it sounds like it's gonna be in place and I also applaud um, the hard work of all of our facilities folks. That's, it's really exciting to hear that um, Schultz was going above and beyond with that mitigation. But I'm curious about things like, when will the kids be outside during the day? Can we take advantage of doing things like putting up tents and creating other outside spaces? Um, I hear that, I know that um, the intent forms inform the master scheduling, but I feel like requiring such rigidity with the binding intent form with so little detail offered is a hard position to put both staff and parents in. Um, I understand also that the re-rostering difficulty, which I'm assuming means kids not necessarily ending up with the same teacher they started with. I get that that would be a difficulty, um, but I would argue that this, it sounds like the district is putting that choice of whether or not a kid can handle being in a different teacher's class. Um, at that decision is with the district rather than with the family. If the family would feel more comfortable, it's springtime and it looks like I'd rather have my kid in person because risk looks lower. And I know that this means they might have a different teacher. I'd, I'd like the flexibility to be able to make those decisions. Or I, you know, I think flexibility being the name of the game from multiple people. Um, I'm grateful for those of you who've asked those granular questions. I think that's really important for both faculty and family. Um, I trust that you guys are handling individual cases 
on their own, but I would um, turn back to the ninth grade mother we heard from earlier, who has clearly not had her son's case handled in a way that seems like it serves the best interests of the child. And if I worry that the rigidity this plan is putting forth, forth um, is gonna make that individual cases harder and harder to deal with. And I think that's it. Sorry if my notes were all over. I appreciate your help. And like I said, all you do, much obliged. Thank you, Ms. Ike. Who's next, Mr. Cuomo? Um, I do not see anybody else who has a hand up at this time or anybody who has made a comment in the chat. So all is quiet on my end. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, let's um, go ahead and close public comment at this time and go to board member comments. Before we go to um, board member comments, well, go ahead. Um, I'll go with, uh, who would like to go first amongst the board member comments? Um, this is Juan Wade, um, I have no comments. Excellent. Mr. Bryant? Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank um, Dr. Atkins and her staff for the great job they've done getting us to this point. Also wanna thank all of those who who spoke tonight um, during public comment. Do appreciate your comments and um, we certainly do take them seriously. And um, thank you for, for your continued support. Um, the only concern that I have, um, we talked about a lot is, is the transportation piece and, and it seems like I've gone dark here. Oh, the transportation piece, um, I'm hoping that those intent forms um, hopefully will come back at least as close to 100% as we can because a lot of our children do depend on transportation to school. Uh, and um, I don't know if we did any outreach to the churches so we can get that announcement out um, that can be announced during our local church services. Um, the community representatives, especially in public housing, um, to get that information. I know Denise and the other young lady will be going out into the community, but that's the only concern um, that I have in terms of the transportation piece, making sure that we get as many forms back as we can so that we can match those children up that will enable them to, to get to school. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Um, Ms. Torres? Sure, thank you. Um, so a few things, some questions and some comments. Um, in leading up to our December 16th meeting, I would really like it um, if we had access or me personally um, to some of the data and metrics or the, the rubric, uh, the dashboard stuff so that we could, I'd like to see that daily. Um, and not just be presented with it on the 16th so that I can kind of see those trends. So I, if we could make that, I don't know that everybody else feels the same way, but I, I would like to see that personally, please. Um, a, a question that I've, I've forgotten to ask several times was just in um, some of the mitigation options. Are there buildings that where we can open windows and, and get fresh air? Are we going to be able to do that or open doors, you know, as related to safety and perimeter, but just to try and get some outside air in any of the buildings? Um, there are some windows that can be opened, many cannot. But, um, and uh, unfortunately, Jerry and Mark aren't, I don't think they're still with us on the panel, but um, there are concerns when you leave windows open during especially extreme temperatures, you can throw the HVAC system out of balance. So there can, there are, um, it's not a universal good to just have your windows open, um, but there are some windows that can be open, many cannot. Um, Buford in particular, I know, has a lot of windows that uh, glass goes floor to ceiling, but you can't open anything there. Um, so it's really a mixed bag. Okay, I was just curious about that. Um, and then also, I didn't know if, if um, at any time soon or coming up, um, 
if we were planning to get an update on literacy, I noticed you know some some work that's being done on um, with the EBL, um, and then also it looks like there's a new program that's rolling out or training for that, the LE the letter or LETR. So I'd really love to hear some more about that, um, please. So that's just more of a request. Um, and then also was excited to see that it looks like a lot of the after school clubs are happening. So if, if we can get a comment um, at some point um, in the future, just about how that is happening, I think that's pretty exciting. So um, was happy to see that. And then just to kind of wrap up, I just wanted to also, um, as, as everybody has said, you know, so much gratitude, but I also want to acknowledge that this is really hard all of this um, and it, it's hard for teachers for staff um, for the principals it's it's emotionally psychologically draining um, and taxing and I, I just want to um, acknowledge that and then also ask um, you know if if we are looking forward to, to putting in place or if we have any extra supports for teachers for principals or staff who who might be feeling um, fear um, or anxiety around um, you know coming back into classrooms or just having to deal with this and the decision making um, top to bottom I mean I feel it in my own life but do we have anything else in place that we can offer besides you know EAP services or, or things like that um, because I really want to make sure that that everybody you know feels supported and heard, um, and I just wanted to say that, that that is a concern of mine. Thank you, Ms. Torres. Ms. Torres, we'll bring you at the next meeting uh, some of the strategies that we have in place to make sure that we're supporting our staff. Uh, EAP, of course, is in place, and some other strategies. So, Rose, I just wanted to jump in real quick. I do know that tomorrow, Berla Moran is offering yoga for the um, students, parents, and teachers. Um, I'm planning to go. I'm not doing that to scare anyone off, but I, a brother <laughs> needs some food, too. <laughs> I, heard, I heard you were leading the session. Oh! <laughs> There are a lot of individual efforts going on at schools and, and team building. Um, so we'll bring you some of those. That'd be great. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Dr. Kraft? Hmm. Um, I would like to first, uh, well, thank uh, everybody who spoke during the public comment period. It's sometimes a really hard and intimidating thing to do and I appreciate people coming forward. Um, I'm hoping that somebody is going to reach out to uh, Ms. Simpson uh, regarding her concerns about her son, um, just to, to follow up on that. Um, and I'm, I'd just like to give a shout out to the um, people who've created and maintained the reopening fund that we heard about from Ms. West. Um, I think this is such a wonderful grassroots effort and, um, you know, just an example of how the community can rise up to meet the needs of a difficult situation. So I want to thank everybody involved with that. I think it's awesome. Um, I uh, also, I guess, uh, sort of echoing Ms. Torres' is, um, you know, concern for some of the, you know, um, emotional and wellness um, issues. I was wondering where we are in terms of hiring the, the social workers that we that, uh, we have funding for the social workers and um, perhaps we can get an update on their work. I, you know, I, I wonder really about the stress, uh, you know, of our students, uh, the mental health of our students there. And um, I think this is just a horribly difficult situation for them. Um, and uh, I think that lots of extra support is is needed. Um, something that we've never, you know, we've never been in this situation before, and I hope we never will again. Um, but I think we really need to make sure that, um, you know, that we are aware of the stresses and, um, you know, people who are just feeling depressed and feeling anxious 
I mean, I know how I've been feeling, you know, these last weeks and months and um, <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that, you know, maybe with the additional staff, we can um, meet more of those needs. So I'd love to hear about that maybe in, in an upcoming meeting. Um, and, and also just um, recognizing the pressures on the principals, um, you know, to, you know, to juggle the, uh, you know, the workings of their school and, and uh, you know, the, the opening of the school and, uh, you know, just dealing with all of the different pressure points there. I hope that we are supporting our principals adequately um, as well. Um, and, I guess I can't just, uh, I never can say enough about how wonderful our staff is or are. I don't know what's the correct grammar there, but uh, our staff and Dr. Atkins, and I think, uh, you know, I just continue every time, you know, I, I come to a school board meeting and I hear what everybody's been doing. And um, I, I'm just, you know, so grateful. I think we just have, um, you know, just a degree of commitment and excellence that um, amazes me all the time. So uh, thank you again. And uh, with that, I will be quiet. I want to sign up for the yoga, so Juan's going to have to tell me how to do that. <laughs> Ms. Kadari, did you want to have anything to add here? No, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome to your first board meeting. Thank you. Um, Ms. Perrier? Um, I would like to say to Ms. Kadari, thank you for your thoughtful questions. Um, I think that's why I enjoy working with students. They always make you think of things that you may not have spoken about. Um, something that we're trained not to do, but I think it's important to do tonight is that everyone this evening during public comment regardless of what your concerns were, you understood the level of difficulty a pandemic presents. And it has presented everyone with challenges. Um, I know that Mr. Wade is going to lead us in uh, yoga at our next board meeting. So I want everyone to please come dressed appropriately. Disagree, it's not on the agenda. <laughs> okay, it's not on the agenda, but it's happening. Um, but we, this is difficult for everybody, not only for the board, but everyone in the CCS community. And I think that we have handled it with dignity and grace. And I hear us talking about making sure that we take care of everybody. And LaShondra and Sherry and Lisa and James and Juan and Jennifer always talk about everybody. Not only the people within our community, but the people within our building. And I think that it's a wonderful thing that Dr. Atkins and her team recognize the complete family. And that's everybody that's in our family from the bottom up, from the top down, from left, right, horizontal or vertically. And uh, I hope that a particular person on the screen uh, does not get upset with me this evening, but it says a lot about a person when they have a very special day and they take that special day to spend it with us. And if you all don't know who I'm talking about, then I'm gonna just put it out there because today is a lady's name by Dr. Rosa Atkins. I don't know if any of you all know her, but today is her day. Today is her birthday. And I want us all to clap and give her a shout out because she came Happy to work on her day. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rosa. Happy birthday to you. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Happy 39th. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, Ms. Brick. And thank you for that serenade. That was wonderful. 
Thank you, Ms. Perrier. Um, Ms. Bryson Morsberger, you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, I just have a few questions to see if we could add them um, or follow up at the next meeting. Um, since we'll be getting the details of the survey, if we could um, have just like a, a summary of the, you know, the request in that we talked about with HR, uh, the number of medical versus the number of, you know, in the other category. Um, and then I know we did MAP testing and PALS. And so maybe next meeting, if we could get an update on where our students are, or some type of screen snapshot um, about, you know, where students are on grade level and things like that. And um, for voting, you know, and for parents, I don't know if it's in the agenda or meeting notes from last meeting, but the granular level of what the day looks like for high school or middle school or elementary school students is important. And so if there's anywhere we can point them to on the website, because I had questions from parents who were saying, you know, they're torn about, they're torn about in-person versus virtual. And if they're gonna, send the student back in person, but the other days are just going to be, you know that word I can't think of. Pre-record. Yes, there you go. Um, that that would contribute to their decision. So those granular, granular levels are important. If we could get a hot spot update, I've gotten some questions about hot spot shortages maybe, not sure, but adding that on there. And then I know that uh, parents' uh, concerns are personal, um, but since the one parent did bring those concerns, if we could get an update on just the process and help her so that they can drop the photography elective. Um, and then um, if you can, uh, and at least on the staff survey, include a question about childcare and childcare times and if that affects their arrival time or scheduling for when we go back. And I guess in both December, or our, our meeting later this month and in December, um, later this month, you're gonna tell us about the survey results. And then at our December meeting, can you update us on uh, the approvals for uh, accommodations and you know the percentage of staff that'll be virtual versus in-person, the percentage of students that will be virtual at that time, what we have. So it was just some more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so I don't, I appreciate all the public comments. Um, was there any other board, I, I might have missed somebody. I don't think I did, but really appreciate, and I, um, I was, um, I'm sorry that I, I didn't get to my emails until today. So um, that Ms. Simpson's did not get responded to today. I had thought, I, I look forward to that being um, followed up on um, and, um, so, and thank you for the committee's work, the community's work. I'm so grateful for the numbers right now being so low. Um, it really does show that um, the community's efforts are working um, and we wanna maintain and continue that. So thank you to everybody for that. Um, I don't have anything, I'm sure I have things, but I have forgotten them. And, um, but I do appreciate everybody um, who, who commented, but also to the great work that our staff has been doing. Um, and of course the PTO uh, raising all of that money. It's very, it's extraordinary. I know how hard it is to raise money and uh, it is, it's exciting um, that we've been able to do so much, that you all have been able to do such good work with that, with that money. It's, it's great. Um, so I don't have any other comments, so I'm going to lead it to Ms. Dr. Atkins. And I'm so sorry I didn't recognize, know that it was your birthday, and happy birthday. Thank you. It's been a fun day. Thank you so much. Um, I also uh, want to uh, do a little responding to um, Dr. Kraft's question about supporting our staff. There is a, a community network, and so often when board members ask questions, um, we think about answering it from our school division perspective and internally and what's happening internally. But we have a whole network of community supports that we're so grateful for. So there is, uh, Dr. Kraft, a community network of counselors that have been working with our teachers, made themselves available to our staff. 
uh, to provide the support that they need and the counseling that they might need uh, during this difficult time. And Beth Chuck has sent that information out to our staff to let them know that that's available to them. So great question. Thank you for asking us that. Also, thank you also for all of the um, comments that we've received tonight in public comment and the, the fund to support our students. I'm just so excited about that. And it, it will go a long way in helping our students to be prepared and to respond to their needs um, in, in the virtual setting or just in the day-to-day -day living that they have to do. Thank you to uh, Bianca and Denise Johnson uh, and all of a whole host of volunteers uh, for the our first grand event that was response to essential needs of our students on uh, that distribution uh, where we handed out uh, just clothing, uh, be it outer clothing or underclothing and, and personal items uh, to our community members as they needed it. It was a great event. Uh, Ms. Torres was there uh, helping to hand down and other board members and staff members. So thank you so much to the whole team for making that happen. And we do have another event that will be coming up in December to continue to respond to the needs of our community. Um, public comment about when the board, uh, we will be bringing back information to the board on our LGBT um, community and lessons and, and um, curriculum. Uh, the State Department of Education is scheduled to give all school divisions guidance in that area by December 31st. Um, what we'd like to do is take that guidance and align it with any of the efforts that are going on in our school division and bring that back to our board. Um, we want to make sure that we present to our families uh, and to our community any curricula that we have or lessons that we have in that area in order to give our community a, a chance to review those. Um, we oftentimes highlight, um, during my comments, we highlight the great work that's going on in our school division with our staff and with our teachers. And this year, um, just because we're teaching in a virtual environment does not uh, mean that we don't have great examples of excellence going on. So we have started um, recognizing teachers for the VIP award, the Virtual Instruction Pro Award. Um, so now we're gonna ask Dr. Odie to recognize some of our shining stars who have already received the VIP award. Dr. Odie, explain the award a little and then let's recognize our staff. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Uh, this is really a great opportunity for colleagues, for, for CCS staff members to recognize their colleagues for their uh, excellent instruction during this very challenging and different time of virtual instruction. Uh, and so we've, we started this in early October, um, shared it out with staff with uh, just a little uh, short survey of, of listing who they would like to nominate. Uh, why they would like to nominate them. We've asked them to share their school, their grade level, uh, and then just a short narrative of what they have done to support students and staff. And sometimes uh, they submit a video or, or an image of, of their nominees uh, with their nomination. We've had over 70 nominations in just three weeks. Uh, so. Uh, and, and here you see, well, I'll tell you the three weeks we've, we have um, narrowed it down to five uh, winners for each of those weeks, all the, each of those weeks, although all of the nominees are winners. Um, but uh, we have a committee that works together to, to look at the nominations and then to narrow it down to a few. Uh, we'll continue this process as we continue in virtual instruction. So here uh, you see some of our, nomin our nominee nominees <laughs> um, here, uh, Lindley Price, first grade at Burnley Moran, Maggie Bunter, fifth grade at Walker, Shannon Wilson, Wilson, a SPED teacher at Walker, Christine Thalwitz, a Spanish teacher at Buford, and Muggsy Marini, one of our APs over at Walker. And we also have Janine Daly, a gifted resource teacher um, in sixth grade math at Walker, Meg Greenwood, a first grade teacher at Venable, 
Melanie Johnson, gifted resource at Jackson Bio. Andy Jones, one of our instructional coaches over at Buford. Catherine Salem, lead teacher at Jackson Bio. And our, our latest ones, Christy Hartwell, kindergarten teacher at Johnson. Noel Mitchell, kindergarten instructional assistant at Johnson. Jessica Scott, second grade at Burnley Moran. Laura Shea, first grade at Burnley Moran. And Emily Waters, an orchestra director at Walton. And so the nominations are due every Thursday. Uh, and we, we receive them constantly. We, uh, we uh, share out the winners uh, every Monday uh, or the, the selected nominees on Mondays. Uh, so the, the, um, all of the Charlottesville teachers receive the email and it has these, uh, these folks there and as well as the statement that their nominator shared about their practice. So everyone gets to see and celebrate our VEPs. We know that we have many, many, as I said, we have over 70 nominations so far. We know that we'll continue to receive those as we continue in virtual instruction. We're very proud of the work that our teachers are doing. Uh, as as uh, Ms. Torres says, this is hard. It is hard. Uh, and we have teachers that are doing outstanding work. Uh, because we all have students first, that we, we're doing it for kids. So we thank you for all that are nominating. And these nominations come from teachers, from coaches, from coordinators, from principals, from assistant principals. We're getting nominations from so many different people and we appreciate it. Um, we'll continue to celebrate greatness here in the Charlottesville City Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Odie. And if you look at those pictures of our, our teachers, every one of them has such a bright smile on their face. It just makes you, reassures you that even in this difficult time, there is great work going on. There's wonderful work going on. Um, and we love watching our teachers um, get the work done. So um, thank you to our school board representative. Um, we're so glad to have you here with us, Ms. Kadari. We, we just love hearing your voice. So thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to having you next week. And thank you to all our board members. You have difficult decisions to make um, for all of your work, for what you have done. We appreciate you so very much. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Um, work session wrap up, Dr. Maftist. I guess you got yes, a couple things on that list. Uh, well, we didn't have much until near the end. That yeah. changed. Um, Ms. Bryce Morseberger asked us some tough questions that, about details regarding start times, various start times, uh, what happens with singleton teachers in virtual and face-to-face, -face, uh, the synchronous and asynchronous, looking at high school student schedules, um, having school-based flexibility, looking at having a COVID Virus Relief Act policy, uh, for the school division, um, access to the data and the metrics and dashboard. And I wanted to ask Ms. Torres, are you talking about the Charlottesville City Schools dashboard when that is developed or data like you received tonight or what sort of ongoing data are you interested in? Um, all of it. Um, well, I guess what, what you're looking at and tracking, um, you know, even if there's something that, that may not be displayed um, necessarily on our school um, dashboard, just kind of leading up to that. I, I okay, that helps. Thank you. Um, an update on literacy, some comments about the after school clubs. Um, Dr. Adkins uh, addressed the question about extra support for teachers and staff, but we'll see if there's anything else to be added there. Information about hiring of the social workers and that work, how it's going a summary um, of the request for the HR with the medical and other reasons, information about MAP and PALS testing where our students are at this point, granular level for what uh, the day will look like when, um, how, where it will be on the website so that parents can find that to, to know as they're answering questions, hotspot update, um, an update on that parental request from earlier this evening, 
A question from the survey about childcare and how that might affect staffing decisions uh, for their return. Um, information about the approval of the accommodations at the December meeting, looking at the percentage of students and staff who will be virtual and those who will be face-to-face. -face. Thank you, Dr. Baptist. I really do appreciate the way you do that. Um, our next meetings are Thursday, November 19th at five o'clock um, via Zoom. And then Thursday, December 3rd via Zoom at five o'clock, we will have another school board meeting. And then Wednesday, December 16th, we will have work session slash um, uh, meeting at five o'clock, no, at four o'clock via Zoom on December 16th. So those are the next three meetings um, that we have. And hearing no objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Happy birthday, Dr. Atkins. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Thank Mr. You, Bye, y'all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.